Hello friends, this marks the beginning of a nine-part series on my channel called My Property Isn't Normal. This was suggested by Grim Creep and Murder Bird, totally awesome, gave me full access to the entire story. So we shall read it over the coming week, week and a half, and I hope that you guys will enjoy. So with that said, let's jump into it. My Property Isn't Normal. Written by Murderbird17. Narrated by Brandon Dayton. You could say I live in the middle of nowhere. I prefer to call it the middle of the wilderness, though. And after living alone out here long enough, I thought I'd become familiar with the land out here, and even get comfortable. But I've never gotten comfortable. Maybe used to this place, but never comfortable. Pretty sure I can hold my own out here for the time being, but even so, lots of weird shit happens out here. Glad to finally have a way to tell strangers who probably won't judge or call me crazy, though. Back to the topic at hand, weird stuff. I'll start with the first odd experience I had here. When I first purchased this land, I was really excited. There was already a house on the property that was the perfect size for me. Not only that, but it seemed pretty new. Like the former owners didn't stay around very long. Yeah, red flags, but how was I supposed to know how messed up this place was? Anyway, I move in without any issues, and within a week I'm out on some of the trails that were already there, looking for deer tracks or other game trails. I'm already having a pretty relaxing time until I swear I hear a baby say, Mama! in the most stereotypical voice I've ever heard, off in the distance. Now, like I said, I'm here in the middle of nowhere, so there shouldn't be anyone for miles. I just shook it off as me hearing things. Twenty minutes later, I hear the same voice say, Mama! again. Only this time it's forty yards away, on the other side of some trees and brush. It didn't even sound like a real baby. It just sounded like some disturbed dude. Of course, at this point, he is definitely on my property as well. I start making my way through the undergrowth, and then, when I'm sure I'm about to hit where he was, the brush clears out to a clearing, and I finally get a glimpse of the man. He was butt naked, and halfway behind a tree, and flaunting a huge smile while his eyes stay kinda squinty. He was also pretty skinny as I could see his ribs. Now usually when you hear people say, At this moment, my blood ran cold. But honestly, mine didn't. I was looking at some butt-naked crackhead trespassing on my property. He decided to let out another MAMA during the silence when I was trying to figure out my next move, so I promptly responded with a hearty, WHAT THE ACTUAL FUCK ARE YOU DOING? That's when he decided my next move for me. He started running at me, and I might have run away if he hadn't been so scrawny. So when he reached me with that big smile and he looked like he was about to grab me, I punched him in the throat. It was a good punch. I was proud of it, honestly. It would have kept any normal man on the ground for at least a minute. This is when I got the first hint that this wasn't a normal man. While I was standing there, proud of my Mike Tyson-level haymaker, the guy immediately got back to his feet, and before I had time to hit him again, he dive-tackled me to the ground. And it hurt pretty bad. He somehow pinned my shoulders to the ground, and no matter how hard I kicked and punched him, he wouldn't let up, so... I was forced to use Plan B. I pulled out my trusty Bear Grylls survival knife, and I stabbed him in the gut. Twice. This finally got his attention, and he hopped back to his feet, slinging blood all over me in the process. I got back to my feet, knife in hand, and waited for him to do something else. All he did, though, was stick a finger into his wound, and then lick the blood off. And then he cartwheeled into the woods, crying like an actual newborn baby this time. Now, by this point, I was pretty on edge, and right as he got far enough away that I could no longer hear him, I just turned and walked home. I knew I should have run, but running through the woods is so tiring, and I just didn't feel like it. When I got home, all was normal again, for a while. Another story that comes to mind when I think about odd things happening around the area is the event that led me to no longer camp in my woods. By the time that the events in this story took place, I had already experienced quite a few things on this property, and this was easily the third freakiest thing to happen up until that point. 
right behind the naked stab victim that cried like a baby and cartwheeled into our woods. This time I had decided that I wanted to go camping. Despite all the stuff that had happened, I had never been seriously injured in those woods. So, why not go sleep in them? Bad choice, I know. Anyways, the first few hours when I got into the woods went fine. I set up camp, built a fire, burnt myself trying to cook a fucking hot dog, pissed on the fire that burnt me, and then I started to realize that camping's pretty boring when you're all alone. So I decided to go to sleep. Next thing I know, I wake up to the sound of a young girl's voice down in the creek. Sounds like she's about college age. She's saying, Help! I need some help down here! I'm lost! Dad! Help! And I can hear her down by the creek from my tent. Now, this isn't the first time I've been lured into the woods by a voice pleading for help. But this voice was a lot more convincing than the others. Nonetheless, I still brought my newly purchased 45 caliber handgun that I had bought for dealing with the... things on this land. I made my way into the creek, flashlight in hand, and I headed down towards the voice. Soon, I found the source. Now, I didn't put the flashlight beam on her right away because I didn't want to blind her, but I could clearly see the outline of a small girl sitting on the bank of the creek. I got about 15 feet away, and she stopped me, stating that, You really don't need that flashlight with the moon out like this. It wasn't even close to a full moon, so that confused me a little. I replied with, I don't know about you, but I can't see a thing out here. Let me help you though, or are you hurt? And then I started to shine the flashlight on her, but she screamed STOP before I got to her face. This time her voice wasn't as convincing. I could tell she wasn't human. Now what you guys need to realize is, I'm not a badass, and I'm not trying to sound cool or tough. But ever since something happened three years ago, the same event that caused me to move out here, I don't respond to situations the same anymore. Maybe I'm not scared of death anymore, maybe I'm mentally unstable, maybe I'm just weird, but when I established that this thing wasn't human, I started to smile. It fooled me, it got me out here into the woods, in its domain, and it was probably going to make an attempt on my life, but I might as well piss it off a little. So I flicked my flashlight up and revealed its face. It actually was a girl, sort of. She was super pale and had abnormally large eyes that were completely black. When the light hit her face, her head snapped forward. And she made eye contact with me and her jaw dropped open three times larger than any humans could. And then she screamed. It was loud, like inhuman loud. It sounded like a girl's scream, but as if it were being played through massive speakers to make it ear-splitting. Then I felt something closing around my neck. She hadn't moved, but was somehow choking me, still screaming. I've realized while living here that the entities that can hurt you can also get hurt themselves. Now most of them are tough as nails, but they can be hurt. This memory went through my head just as I felt something warm dripping onto my neck, and my left ear went quiet busted eardrum. I aggressively threw my flashlight at the bitch and it connected with what I assume was her eye. I couldn't tell for sure because I didn't have a flashlight. And yes, I forgot to use the gun. It was new, and in the current life or death situation, I'd forgot it. Luckily this girl wasn't one of the tough ones, and I felt the grip on my neck loosen and her scream stopped. No sooner had I taken my first breath when she bent over backwards possession style and sprinted into the woods in reverse. When I finally caught my breath, I slowly walked back to my campsite and went to sleep in the tent. You might be asking why I didn't go home after that, but it was like a 20 minute hike and my flashlight was broken, so I had to wait until morning. Pretty good sleep though, no noises woke me up. I woke up the next morning expecting my ear to be killing me, but miraculously it was completely back to normal. I later figured out that it was the lady in the tree who fixed my ear, but that's a story for another time. That morning I just packed up everything and headed back home. The only thing that got messed up was my flashlight, so I wasn't even that disappointed in the trip. I still don't camp out there anymore because no matter how weirdly wired I am, that girl really did freak me out a good bit, and I'm sure she's still out there. What you will notice so far is that these entities aren't really effective killers but that doesn't go for everything out there. 
I can't tell y'all about the property without mentioning Skinny. Fuck Skinny. I understand that skinwalkers are a common topic on the horror scene at the moment, and from what I can tell, I think that's the creature that I'm dealing with. But I could also be wrong, because if this is a skinwalker, it's advanced to another level. Not only does it imitate voice, it imitates appearance, and it really wants me dead, or gone. I like to call it Skinny. I think it pisses him off, though. And when I say his name, I say it loud, because, especially at night, I know he's listening. I've lived here for three years now, and he's been harassing me for about a year. And he's good. One of the smartest things to come after me so far. The only one that can seem to almost get into my head. He tries to lure me out not by pretending to be someone in trouble like the other imitators that I've dealt with before. He's aware that that stuff doesn't work on me anymore. No, he tries to piss me off. He wants me to try and kill him. The problem is, we both know I probably can't. One time he got me, though. I was watching a documentary about veteran suicide. It's a terrible topic. I'm a supporter of our armed forces, and I think it's terrible that our government doesn't take better care of our vets that risk everything overseas so we don't have to. They were doing a slideshow of men who had, unfortunately, lost the struggle with their own demons. I had to look away for a second because this one guy that appeared on the screen looked too young and happy to have gone to this dark of a place. He was mixed race from what I could tell, athletic looking and had a big dimpled smile on his face. When I look away I'm suddenly staring at the same kid, outside my window. Same smile, same build, same uniform, one difference. Across his forehead was the word, failure. I instantly knew it was skinny. He wasn't trying to imitate this kid, he was insulting him, and he finally struck a nerve. I had seen him imitate so many other people and try so many other tactics, but this was the one that finally broke me. I was ending this creature. I exploded out of my chair and bolted from my bedroom, grabbed my 45 caliber handgun and proceeded to walk towards the same window the young soldier was still staring through. I got within five feet and saw the word had changed. It now spelled out, I deserved it. After reading this, I didn't hesitate to raise my gun and fire two shots, but I think he ducked him. The bastard is fast. I stormed outside to try and find him, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen. That's when I hear, Gotcha! whispered into my ear, and I was flung against the wall of my house. The gun flew out of my hand in the process, broke two ribs and dislocated my right shoulder. I was a dead man and he knew it. Ever since the incident that led me to buy a house by myself out in the middle of the woods, I don't think I've ever felt fear again. Something is wrong with my head, but I did feel defeat. I fell for his trap, and now he's going to kill me. As these thoughts passed through my brain, I passed out from the pain, and the concussion, probably. Then for some reason that I still don't understand, I woke up. It was bright outside, and I was covered in blood and in more pain than I had ever been in my entire life. But I was alive. Why was I alive? I struggled to stand up with my right arm hanging loosely at my side, and I soon noticed the words carved into the outside wall of my house. Next time. Fuck. Skinny. Ever since I got back from the hospital, I told the doctors I fell off a roof. I've been trying to find ways to deal with or kill a skinwalker. If there is a way, or if he's even a skinwalker, he beat me. I'm usually pretty lighthearted with most of my experiences, no matter how intense they are, but I just can't with this one, because if I lose to Skinny again, I guess I will be signing off for good. Be careful out there, and don't get fooled like me. There isn't always a next time. But hey! Not dead yet, so maybe there will be a next time. I plan on writing down more of my experiences in the future, so keep your eyes peeled for those. Until next time, Cole, signing off. Skinwalkers and tree nymphs and bat girls, oh my. <laughs> this series is going to be a great one, I can already tell. I like it a lot. Thank you so much to Grim Creep for the suggestion. My goodness. When it was suggested to me, he told me that it would fit my voice pretty well, and yeah, I think he's right. Murder Bird does kind of write in the same way that I naturally talk, so it's a pretty natural progression, I do think. 
But anyways, friends, I hope that you've enjoyed this episode. Let me know what you thought. I hope that you'll like, comment, and or subscribe. There's just so much good stuff going on on this channel. And I thank you guys for motivating me into it. You're the best. Anyways, I hope to see you again tomorrow. Thank you, as always, for listening. I hope that you guys will keep yourselves safe out there. Watch out for Skinny. <laughs> and until the next time, friends. Bye-bye. Welcome back, friends. This is part number two of an ongoing story. If you missed part number one, go ahead and check the pinned comment to navigate things just a little bit easier. With that out of the way, let's jump into this. My Property Isn't Normal, Part 2. Written by Murderbird17. Narrated by Brandon Dayton. I'm happy to see that my experiences from part one got some attention. Wasn't expecting this stuff to actually get any traction. I'm mainly here to vent and have a place to catalog the stuff that happens around my house. People also seem to enjoy the part where the naked dude attacked me, and then cartwheeled into the woods crying like a baby when I stabbed him. Still not sure if he was human. Now, I feel obligated to tell some more of my experiences. Also, feel free to leave any questions you have, and I'll try to answer them in the next post. That being said, if you haven't read part one, I suggest you go back now and read it. I'm going to tell you the following experiences as if you already know about the other experiences I've written about having on this property. This place is not normal after all, and takes some getting used to. Now that the intro's out of the way, I think we can start with camo. And camo is a fucking nuisance. The first time I came into contact with him was during the first white-tailed deer season I had on my property. Now, I'm a hunter, but the program that is helping me after the incident, said I wasn't allowed to have guns because the noise draws too much attention. Bullshit. I live in the middle of nowhere, and there isn't anybody else for miles, unless you count the Chosen, but I'm pretty sure that the program isn't worried about them. Luckily, the lady in the tree hooked me up with the 45 caliber I now have in my possession, but I didn't have it upon first meeting Camo, unfortunately. Anyway, back to the story. I first saw him when I was walking towards a ladder stand that I had set up in a tree to watch deer, since I could no longer kill him. And yes, I could have had a bow, but I'm shit with a bow, and I would risk just hurting the animal. And I don't like the idea of an animal that is suffering because I couldn't make a shot that would kill it instantly. Now, as I approach my stand, I notice a figure already sitting in it. He's about the size of a regular human. He was dressed in full camouflage, pants, jacket, boots, hat, face mask and a backpack. He actually seemed like a regular person, which I hadn't seen any of those in the woods for the entirety of the four months I had been living there. The things that live on this property are generally more... extreme. But no matter how relieved I was to see a proper human for once, he was deep in my property, and hunting in my stand. I had to get him to leave. I reluctantly shouted over to him, Hey! You ain't supposed to be here! Time to go, dude! Now I was about 75 yards away and to his left, but I yelled plenty loud for him to hear me clearly. He didn't flinch. He stayed facing straight forward like a statue. What a prick. Look, try to be creepy all you want, but ignoring someone like that is just rude. I know he hears me. I have reason to believe he was just trying to freak me out because I've made him break character before. So after I yell and he ignores me, I start getting impatient. I yelled the same thing at him again a little louder, and still ended up with the same response. What a dick. Now I'm livid because he's making me ruin all chances of seeing deer this afternoon by making me yell at him. So naturally, I start a brisk stroll over to tell him off to his face, or maybe to kick his ass. I already noticed he didn't have a rifle, so I assumed that he was just watching, like I was planning on doing. Of course, he could have had a concealed handgun, but I'm a dumbass, so I didn't consider that. Then suddenly I heard the crunch of something under my foot, and the sudden sound of rope sliding across the surface at high speed. I froze for a fraction of a second, and before I could squeak out an oh shit, I'm hanging upside down by my ankle. There was a loop around my leg that held me suspended seven feet off the ground like a damn cartoon. I was like a fucking Looney Tunes character. I couldn't help but roll my eyes. I immediately knew it was camo, and when I look up, or down, Shit, I was upside down, so I don't really know where I had to look, but I saw him climbing slowly down the ladder. Like, really slowly. What a dramatic guy. If he wasn't so obsessed with appearances, he probably could have killed me. That's what I think he wanted to do anyways. 
There was a machete on his hip that I could now see, and the blade was chipped at in a way that made it look serrated. Wouldn't have been a very useful tool, unless you wanted to use it to inflict pain. I think the biggest flaw with Camo's trap, though, was that he didn't account for the single fact that 99% of people who live alone in the woods learn that carrying a large knife at all times is a necessary thing if you want to stay alive. I wish I could tell you that I did a flip after I cut myself down and landed on my feet like some sort of badass, but I didn't. I landed on the back of my neck, and my vision went dark for about 15 seconds, which I guess was enough time for Tweedle Dumbass to finally get to the bottom of my ladder stand. As I stood up, I saw that he was standing completely still at the base of the stand, still about 50 yards away from me, staring at me. I could hear his thoughts from here. Damn, why did he get out? Shit, shit, shit! Then he turned and bolted. The dude was booking. I lost sight of him in less than 30 seconds into the chase and had to give up. I need to jog more. And what's more, by the time I got back to the ladder stand, it was already getting dark. I didn't even get to watch any deer. I've seen Camo on multiple other occasions as well, but I figured him out. He got me the first time, but his traps really aren't that sneaky. They're elaborate, but not sneaky. He always appears in an area that I plan on hunting in. Don't know how he knows where I'm going to be, but I stopped questioning stuff on this land a long time ago. And I always notice him long before I get to the location. Again, I have no idea how he plans this shit out. And secondly, there's always a trap set somewhere directly between where I first spot him and his actual location. Like if I were to draw a line from him to where I see him from, the trap will always be on that line. Another important thing to realize is that none of his traps are fatal. They're all meant to keep me from escaping, but not to kill me. They do hurt, though. One time I almost stepped in a bear trap he had set out, and it for sure would have broken my leg had it got me. The non-fatal part was his downfall. I figured out that he didn't want me to die in a trap. He probably wanted to do the deed himself, or maybe do something else, but he really didn't want me dead in a trap. So all I had to do to get him riled up was die in a trap, right? After the lady in the tree hooked me up with the pistol, a little over a year and a half ago, one of the first problems I wanted to solve with it was the creator of the various nets, ankle snares, and holes that attempted to contain me so many times before, and I knew exactly how I was going to do it. One of Camo's recurring traps was just a large 11 foot deep hole, covered by a large amount of suspiciously patterned sticks and leaves that could literally be seen from 100 yards away. I just had to wait until he used this trap again. After a swinging log that I think was supposed to knock me out, and another net that was meant to land on top of me, I might add that it was made of wire so I couldn't cut through it, but it also had a glare from the sunlight that made it impossible not to see. I finally came across the trap that I was looking for. Four weeks after I got the gun, I find myself walking towards an 11 foot hole, trying to pretend I don't see it. Suddenly, I start falling. I was ready for the fall, and let out a loud yell as I traveled downwards, and as I hit the ground I stayed as quiet as possible, which was hard to do considering the broken toe and dislocated knee I had just received. Fuck Camo for making me do this. I army crawled over to the side of the hole and laid my head against the side to make it look like I had broken my neck. And then I waited. It took 15 minutes for that little prick to dramatically make his way over to me, but I heard him walk up to the edge of the hole. I obviously had to close my eyes to appear dead, because I couldn't run the risk of blinking but I almost smiled when I heard Camo mutter to himself, Oh shit, no, 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 they're gonna be so fucking pissed. I took advantage of the moment and quickly opened my eyes and whipped out my pistol, firing three shots at him as quickly as I could. I missed with all but one. The bullet that met its mark put a hole in Camo's shoulder, and he let out a garbled scream of nonsense and gibberish, something along the lines of, You piece of friggin', I can't believe you did that ass fucking shit, ah! He did end up running away, but... As he ran, I heard him say, F fuck this dude, I'm- Aw, oh, shit, I'm fucking done! I was laughing my ass off. Till I realized that I was severely injured and had to climb out of this fucking hole. Good thing it was daytime, though, or I might not have noticed the black rope that Camo had lowered into the hole while he was cursing at himself for killing me. I somehow managed to pop my knee joint back in based on shit I had seen earlier in life and climbed out to limp my way back to the house. That was a good day. Broken toes are fucking expensive to get treated, though. The best part of it is I haven't seen camo since that day. It actually worked. Wish I could pull something like that off with Skinny. Another thing that I guess I need to explain to all of your readers is the lady in the tree. 
I've mentioned her a few times now, and at least some of you are probably wondering about her. I honestly don't know much about her myself, but she is, hands down, the best thing on this property. My first experience with her was when she healed a broken eardrum that I had suffered when meeting what I think was a banshee down in my creek. It was busted when she screeched really loud, and when I went to sleep, I woke up perfectly fine the next morning. I almost thought it was all a dream until I saw the blood still on my pillow and the broken flashlight I had used in personal defense. Well, I guess this was the first time that she affected me directly, but not the first time that she helped me out. The true first time, I didn't even realize it was her until last night. It was the gun. The gun that I talked about purchasing in part one wasn't really purchased. I just wasn't willing to admit that I had looted it off of an old corpse that I had found in an abandoned log cabin in the back of the property. This is an example of how sneaky she is. I only started to wonder if it was her doing while I was recording the first set of these stories, and I started thinking about how good a shape this gun was in. Of course it was a little dirty when I found it, but it was also in perfect operating condition, and I figured that the skeleton that was clutching it didn't need it anymore, but hell, at this point I wouldn't be surprised if he came to life each night. Either way, I left the cabin with a new sidearm and two boxes of ammunition. I didn't really think that much about it because... Finding a gun on a body is pretty mild considering the events that go down here on a week-to-week -week basis. But yesterday I started questioning the real origins of this gun. It was so well maintained and new feeling when I got it, but the skeleton looked like it had been there forever. Not to mention the fact that the gun was unloaded, and the boxes of ammunition were unopened. But the skeleton looked like it had died holding the gun, like he was intending to use it. It didn't add up. So I headed back to the cabin, and I found my answer. Everything was the same when I got there as it had been over a year ago. I meant nothing had changed, especially not the body. The exact same as before. I was nervous at first, not because the body scared me, but because the joke about the skeleton coming back to life from earlier wasn't really that far-fetched in this place. I'd never seen an undead skeleton, but I have seen other forms of undead. Maybe I'll tell y'all about those experiences sometime. Nervous or not, though, I just had to confirm my suspicions. I approached the body and started examining the clothes. Just like I expected, the flannel shirt and brown jeans had no tag. Not like they had been ripped out, but like they were never there to begin with. Now there was only one more thing to check. I took out my knife and scraped the blade down the skeleton's exposed arm bone. Sure enough, a shaving fell off. It was wood. The entire skeleton was made of wood and painted a lightish brown, among other discolorations, to look like the real deal. The lady in the tree is very talented when it comes to wood, but she can do so much more. I've only seen her in person two times, once when I caught a glimpse of her smiling as she walked into an opening into a tree only to close the opening with a door that fit so perfectly I couldn't see the edges when I walked up to it. It just looked like a normal tree, and a second time two days after I encountered the screeching banshee in the creek, I saw her out the window of my front door, smiling in. She winked at me and ducked out of view. I ran to the door to try and see her more fully, but by the time I swung the door open, she was gone into the night. Nowhere to be seen. Which is really annoying. I would almost consider us to be friends by now, and she still won't show herself to me fully. Now, when I saw her for the second time, I didn't know what or who she was. But when I looked at the ground and the feet, I noticed the small sheet of what looked like homemade paper. On it was a short message that read, I wish to congratulate on killing the Keelut. He was bringing an evil over the land that was distressing the forest. I don't know how you actually ended him, but I'm happy all the same. I've seen you roaming, and I'm certain you've seen me. We work towards the same goal, cleansing this land. My vows as a medicine woman keep me from directly interfering with the creatures of this land, but I wish you luck on your mission, and I'll support you from the shadows as best I can. I hope your ear feels better. So maybe the key loot she was talking about me killing, I think it was a rabid coyote that I had killed a few weeks before the creek incident. It was hairless and just stared at me through the trees. I think it was trying to intimidate me to leave its territory, so I shot it between the eyes and left. My territory, bitch. But this was the first time that I realized that I finally had someone on my side on this land, and that was a relief. She was actually really helpful. Once I got bit by a rattlesnake, and when I got home, there was a bottle labeled Anti-Venom sitting on my kitchen table. Another time, I got bit by one of the shadow children while I was hiking, 
and when I got home there was a bottle of purple liquid in a glass vial in the same place on the table. I honestly expected it to heal the wound or something, but it just made me really drunk. Guess she couldn't help me much that time. She's done other stuff too, but now I'm kind of worried about her. I haven't heard or experienced anything from her in eight months. I'm worried something got to her, or even worse. What if she's mad at me? I mean, Skinny almost killed me six months ago, and she didn't do shit. I've grown to like her and even depend on her a bit, but she's just... gone. I think I'll call it quits for this post, but hopefully I can stay alive long enough to post more. The hunt for Skinny continues, and if you don't know who that is, shame on you for not reading the first post before now. And if you do know who that is, I appreciate any suggestions you have for killing him. See you all next time. Cole, signing off. Camo and the Medicine Woman Well, I certainly hope that the tree lady's alright. Maybe she's just laying low, or maybe the forest has gotten distressed to the point where it can't necessarily sustain her anymore. I'm not sure how connected she is to the forest. She is called the Tree Lady, but she calls herself a Medicine Woman, so my thought is she might be human? Anyways, I am glad the Camo's out of the way, and hopefully we won't see any more of him, but it does seem that he was working for some people, so I guess we'll have to see how that works out. Anyways, thank you as always for listening along with me, friends. I hope that you will like, comment, and or subscribe. Join us again tomorrow for part number three. And as always, try to keep yourself safe out there. Watch out for traps. I will see you in the next one. And until then, friends, bye bye Oh, you guys, I apologize so much for the long delay. <laughs> I've just been coming off a cold, not feeling the best, but... I'm, I'm coming back around now, so I figured we should continue this story, but I do feel a bit guilty that I left you guys hanging for so long, so please forgive. This is part number three of an ongoing story. If you've missed parts one and two, check the pinned comment to navigate things a little bit easier. With that out of the way, let's jump into this. My property isn't normal. Written by Murderbird17. Narrated by Brandon Dayton. Hey guys, I'm back. I know it's been a few days since my last post. One of the pails chewed through the wires of my generator, and since civilians aren't allowed out here by the organization, I had to wait three days for one of their electricians to get out here. The only reason I knew it was a pail that chewed through the main cable was because I watched it do it. I was hoping it would electrocute itself, but I forgot the part where that's the only source of power for my house since the Chosen had stolen my backup. This is probably a good time to say that if you haven't read the first two installments of this series, you should, because I highly doubt any of this will make any sense. They aren't long, and I'll link them at the bottom of this post. Back to the regularly scheduled programming, I realized while I was stuck in the dark for the past three days reading books, hiking out of pure boredom, that I haven't told you all about the pails yet. They suck. They're kind of funny once you figure them out, I've seen them on quite a few occasions on the property. The pails are white humanoids that crawl on the ground on all fours, usually dragging their belly and using the same motion that Spider-Man uses to climb walls. They can move at about a jogging pace, and their faces are usually stuck in distorted expressions of pain or anger, and boy, are they stupid as all hell. Let me tell you about the first time I saw one. I had already been living at this place about seven months, I think, so I was kind of becoming familiar with the weird shit that calls this place home. I was out hiking some of my trails, kind of halfway looking for weird shit, halfway minding my own business, and suddenly I can hear what sounds like a baseball player sliding through the leaves of the forest floor, trying to reach home plate ahead of me. Only the sliding didn't stop, and it was coming straight towards me. I prepare myself by taking out my trusty Bear Grylls survival knife and entering what I would describe as an aggressive stance. Felt pretty badass, I'm not gonna lie. Expecting some creature to come barreling out of the bushes in front of me, I was a little shocked to see a butt-naked man with super pale skin drag itself from under the brush on its stomach. What is it with fucking naked dudes on my land? Can't I get a pretty woman at least once? Anyways, after I got done being flabbergasted and became aware of my surroundings again, I became aware that the dude was almost on me and was reaching out for my leg. So I jumped on his back, and it worked like a fucking charm. This little bastard didn't have superhuman strength like some of the things out here, 
So when I landed on its back, it couldn't do anything but sit there and flop its arms and legs around like a fish. <laughs> At this point, I'm on the verge of tears. It hears me laughing and turns its head to try and spit on me, which it can't do, and that made me actually start crying laughing. I fell off it at this point, and the creature quickly turned around and locked its teeth onto the toe of my left boot. I like to wear steel toe boots around the property because even though they're heavy, I know that in a scuffle being able to kick with a boot and not having to worry about breaking a toe is a nice little advantage. This is what led me to realize that even though the creature didn't have super strength, it did have a super bite force. When it first latched onto my boot, I wasn't worried and started trying to shake the thing off without much urgency. I already knew it wasn't a man by this point because it didn't possess an asshole or other genitals. But I got a little worried when I started to notice the end of my boot changing shapes as the steel in the end started to bend. I then said out loud, If you don't stop right now, I'm going to stab you right in the head, you little shit. It paused as if debating on the decision, and then slowly started biting down again while its eyes looked up at me as if trying to call my bluff. I wasn't bluffing. A few seconds later, the thing is frantically clawing its way back into the forest with my favorite Bear Grylls survival knife still in the back of its stupid fucking head. Nobody likes a thief. Got back home fine, but I had to replace my favorite knife and get a new pair of boots, so it was a pretty shitty hike. It was the next time I saw one that I figured out what their biggest fear is, and it is so stupid. I was down in my creek, playing with a new toy I had gotten earlier in the week, it was this net that was designed to catch little minnows and shit, and it was actually a blast. I don't really have any use for minnows or whatever little fish I was catching, because I can't go to the only pond on the property that had big fish in it since I made that deal with the crocodile man. So I was just catching them and letting them go. I'm suddenly greeted by the somewhat familiar sound of a grown man sliding across the ground on their belly. It had been almost two months since the last incident I had with a pail, but I immediately recognized that sound. This was the dunce that had stolen my knife, and I really valued that Bear Grylls survival knife that can be purchased at your local Walmart. It really is a good product. <laughs> Unfortunately, the pail that emerged this time wasn't the same one. It had a different face and was more of a light pink than the original white that was on the first pail. It was still the same type of creature, though. This time, things went down different. As it tore into the clearing that I was in, about 30 feet from me, it froze with its eyes wide. As it had torn through the brush, I was already facing its direction, holding the net spread out to my side the same way a bullfighter holds a red cape, since I was preparing to throw the net into the creek. The pale's eyes were switched between looking at the net and looking at me, so I looked at the net and back to him, and then it clicked. No way, I giggled to myself, and I started to catch on what was happening. I took advantage of my suspicions and started running and flailing the net around at the pail, and it freaked the fuck out. It actually rolled over trying to turn so fast as it spun around and took off into the woods. I then started wheeze laughing as I fell on the ground with tears running down my face. This fucking thing can bite through steel, but it's terrified of a nylon net. I know that might not be funny to some, because I have a twisted sense of humor, but it made my week. Long story short, I keep the little net in my hiking bag every time I go out now, and every pail I've come across is utterly mind-fucked at the sight of it. Good times, man. Wish all the things around here were that easy to deal with. On another note, I got an email from an organization asking me about the key loot that the lady in the tree claimed that I had killed in the last post. They wanted to know if I had disposed of the body, and if they could come and retrieve the remains from the woods if I had just left it. Then they said something that caught me off guard. When I said something about having to check with the program that put me out here, they responded with, We are the parent organization of that program, and proceeded to give me my own address as well as details about my former life that only the program should have known about. In all seriousness, I have a dark past, and haven't always been a great man, but I'm done with that shit, and it pissed me off that they would even bring it up again. I responded with a simple, Fine, but don't bring that shit up again, and blocked the emailer. No one has shown up yet, but I guess we'll see what happens. On a good note, I haven't seen Skinny in a couple of weeks, so that's nice. See you all next time. Feel free to leave your questions in the comments. And if you have any ideas what these pails are, or what a key loot is, please tell me. If any of you are good with research stuff, I'd appreciate it. Talk to you again soon. Hey Coleman, if you're getting some of that Walmart money for plugging the Bear Grylls survival knife, 
Maybe you could kick some to your old pal Dayton dies, you know? <laughs> I'd definitely appreciate that. We got bills to pay around here. I'm sure you do too. Although it seems like the organization is taking care of an awful lot of stuff. I'm quite curious about the background and... I mean, there's a lot of stuff to be curious about in this story. What is the organization? Why did they put him there? What is his actual background? And then, on top of all that, it's just the the menagerie of creatures. So, very, very interesting series. I can't wait to see how it turns out. It's so short, is, is what gets to me. Like, nine parts? There's so... I know you can't fit everything that I want to know into nine parts, but... Uh, I guess we'll see how close we can get. Anyways, friends, thank you as always for listening along with me. I hope that you'll like, comment, and or subscribe if you did enjoy. And join me again for another No Sleep Creepy Pasta. I can't in good conscience say tomorrow anymore because I've skipped a few days and, and I'm still kind of beating myself up about it. But I'm going to try and be more consistent. Anyways, keep yourselves safe out there. I shall see you in the next one. Keep a net with you, watch out for pails. <laughs> and until then, friends, bye-bye. Dayton Dies has been defunct for over a year now, but I wanted to tell you guys that rumors of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. There was some drama going on on the No Sleep subreddit. Some stories that I hadn't asked permission for, I got posted to a blacklist, Despite having under 100 subscribers at the time, people still decided to come after me, and I lost basically all motivation that I had for this channel. I will be rebooting it now, seeing as there is absolutely still some interest in it. Although, I will be gearing up and doing something a bit different than Reddit content. Cryptids, true crime, serial killers... We'll see which one performs the best and head in that direction. But for now, I still do have permission to read the My Property Isn't Normal series. And I do want to get that one wrapped just for completion's sake. So that is what we will be doing today. If you're still here, thank you so much for your extended patience. And with that said, let's get into this video. My Property Isn't Normal, part number four. Written by Murderbird17. Narrated by Brandon Dayton. Well, I'm back, guys. Welcome to part four of this documentary catalog. Uh, diary. I honestly don't know what this is anymore, because I thought I would only be using this platform to tell stories of stuff that had happened in the past on this property. But now I'm being forced to bring this journal, I guess, to the present. You see, those people from that organization did come to see about the key loot. And now there's a guy named Mark living in my house and sleeping on my couch. Well, not really sleeping. More unconscious, but we'll get to that part a bit later. After a few days of this organization that wouldn't tell me their name not showing up, I figured it was just a troll who managed to figure out my email account and hack into my personal info. But alas, on the third day, he rose. No, not really. <laughs> but four guys did end up knocking on my front door. They were all dressed pretty normally, except for the matching gray combat boots that told me these were men of action, which also means that they're going to try their hardest to push me around and play badass. My suspicions were confirmed when the guy in the lead identified himself as Mark and immediately asked where I claimed to have actually killed a key loot. What a prick. Look, I still don't know what the fuck a key loot is, and I don't claim to have killed one. The lady in the tree said that I killed one, I can only assume that she's talking about that hairless coyote that I killed down near the creek. At the mention of the lady in the tree, they all looked at each other with an expression of, this dude is a waste of time. And the feeling was mutual. I was getting a little impatient by now, so I chimed in with a, if you guys are done being superior to me, 
I can take you to where I killed the coyote. The one behind Mark, whose name I don't remember, says, sure, let's get this over with. And so, 30 minutes later, we're standing in front of where I killed that thing that I now know was not a coyote. Look, I know I may not have clarified it yet, but I killed this thing well over a year ago. Shit, maybe two years. And the only reason that the organization knew that I had killed it was because of the post that I had made earlier this week. A lot of decomposing and feeding can happen to a body in the woods over that long a time. On top of that, I haven't been to this part of the property in a very long time because there weren't any trails or interesting locations here. But I was taken aback when I saw what happened to this body over the course of the two years that it had been out here. Absolutely nothing. The body looked like I had shot it yesterday. The only evidence that it was older was the fact that all the blood had seeped out of the head wound and long since dried up, but the skin and face and the fur on its paws were all completely preserved. It only had fur on its paws, which was odd. When we got to the body, the snickering crew of four went dead silent. You said this was killed around two years ago, didn't you? said Mark. Yeah, but I haven't been down here since. Why is this thing still preserved like that? What the hell is happening? I questioned. One of the guys, who hadn't said a word up until this point, suddenly chimed in. Keyloots are so unnatural and dark that nothing that occurs in nature will have anything to do with an authentic one. That includes bacteria, fungi, and scavenger animals. And he muttered something about a level 107 beast. Mark looked at me with a serious face and said, So, if this Keyloot story is true, does that mean all the shit that you said in those posts about this place were true? Before I could answer with a, What do you think, asshole? A low, raspy laughter started to surround us and began closing in. It was coming from all directions. We looked up from the body to see at least 50 hooded figures surrounding us and laughing menacingly. All four of the military men pulled their concealed pistols and took aim, but before they could fire a shot, I called out over the laughing, Hector, I told you the next time you and your little chosen crew sneak up on me, I'm kicking your asses again. Everyone paused. The chosen, the four organization men, and the pale that had just crested a hill 30 yards behind one of the cult members. A few seconds later, one of the hooded figures took off his hood to reveal a chubby, jolly-looking face with rosy cheeks and wire-rimmed prescription glasses. Aw, oh, man, we didn't know they were with you, Cole. <laughs> we thought they were trespassers. We're sorry, Hector said with a downcast gaze. Why do you even need them to begin with? I retorted. Hector hesitated for a moment and then said, Our god wants a real sacrifice, and those white, crawly, humanoid thingies just, uh, aren't doing it for him anymore. At this moment, the pail that I could see frozen at the top of the hill turned and bolted back into the woods. Hector then proceeded to call to the other figures, They're with Cole! We can't have them! There was a collective sigh as all the Chosen looked at the ground and walked away into the woods. I didn't notice until they were all gone that the four organization men hadn't lowered their weapons the entire time. You pussies get ready to head back to the house. It gets dark in 45 minutes and if those guys got you on edge, <laughs> then you won't last long at night. Mark shot me a look that explained in detail just how much he hated me without the need for words, while his three partners put on thick rubber gloves and put the key loot into a sort of body bag. As we're walking back towards my house, with the three stooges carrying the corpse of the dog demon, Mark starts questioning me. What was that group back there? Some cult, I guess. They told me that they worship Cthulhu or something. He seems kind of taken aback for a second and then asked, Why'd they seem so wary of you? But they didn't flinch when we had our guns trained on them. Simple. They don't fear death. 
but they do crack when exposed to severe pain for long enough. Again, Mark seems surprised by my answer. He's starting to strike me as simple-minded. So, how'd you inflict this pain on them? I don't want to answer any more of these questions. I really didn't. This was the kind of shit that I don't like to dwell on. That was a different life, and I don't like when it seeps back into the present. Sure, it's nice to have the local murder cult leave you alone, but I used methods that I regret to get that luxury. The last thing Mark said to me on our hike back to the house was, Look, dude, my mind is telling me that you're batshit crazy, but my instincts are telling me that you're a threat. Which one are you? I looked him dead in the eyes and mumbled, That's up to you. Let me tell you, the look on his face was priceless. I love mind games. <laughs> a few minutes later, we reached the house and all four of the goons walked up to the big black van that they had arrived in. They started loading up the body as I reached my doorknob to go inside. I hear Mark start raising his voice while talking on the phone. What? This guy isn't even right in the head. I know there's stuff here, but why with... Look, get me a team to... Okay, yes, he does have experience, but... Wait, what did you just say? He then stares at me with a mixture of confusion and disbelief. They told him where I came from. I could tell by the way he looked at me. He hung up the phone without any more arguing and began to walk over to me. As he reaches me, he says, My higher-ups have told me that I need to stay with you for a while and keep an eye on the activity around here. I responded with, You can't be serious. Which I wasn't, he said back and then added, They also want me to remind you that you didn't pay for this house or this property. With that, I opened my door with my best butler impression and gestured for him to enter my home. As he walked through the door and dropped what I assumed to be his emergency bug-out bag on the floor, he froze. Can I just say one thing real quick? Fuck Skinny. I didn't hear how heavily he was breathing at first because of the van that was making noise as it was driving away, but as those sounds faded, I realized that Mark was breathing like he had just sprinted a marathon. His eyes were trained on the window, with his body completely rigid, with his hand on his hip, ready to draw his gun. I followed his gaze to the window, where I had confronted Skinny so many times before, and sure enough, there he was. Only this time, he wasn't someone that I recognized. This time, he was a fairly attractive, tall, and athletic blonde woman. She was smiling and holding a heart-shaped balloon. Upon closer inspection, I could tell that the balloon read, It's a girl. I rushed in front of Mark to try and snap him out of whatever trance he was in, but I soon realized that tears were welling up in his eyes. By this, I gathered that this woman was no longer with us, and the girl most likely wasn't either. <sighs> Fuck you, Skinny. I calmly started explaining what Skinny was to Mark, but soon after I started, he stopped me. I read the stories, Cole. I know you've talked about this thing before, but I'm trained to handle these kinds of things, so don't worry about me, because I'm gonna fucking kill it. And with that... He made a mad dash to the back door in an effort to get outside and confront Skinny. I managed to block him and push him onto the ground, saying that he won't come inside, so just keep your shit together and we both live. Mark, however, was not in a listening mood. He jumped back to his feet straight into a fighting stance. Oh, great. After a second, he threw a fast left hook straight for my face but he wasn't fast enough. I ducked under the swing and connected my elbow to the underside of his chin. He went out like a light, and by the time the scuffle was over, Skinny was gone. I put Mark on the couch, and now I'm typing this, thinking about going through his computer before he wakes up. Anyway, that's it for today. Please, if anyone knows what a key loot is, let me know. What the hell did I kill? 
And what did Mark mean by he was trained to deal with this kind of stuff? What is he, a monster hunter or something? I'll try to get some answers before my next post. See y'all soon. As we continue on into the story, it seems like we learn more about the property, but that only leads to more questions about our narrator. Is he even a reliable narrator? Can we trust anything that he's saying, or is he possibly pulling us into his delusions? I suppose that's not outside the realm of possibility. But then how do you explain everybody else seeing the key loot, the cultists, and of course, Skinny? We've got five more parts to go in this series, and I hope that you guys are enjoying it as much as I am. Please don't forget to like, comment, and or subscribe if you did enjoy. And as always, keep yourself safe out there. Never negotiate with cultists. I'll see you in the next one. And until then, bye-bye. It has been a while since we've last seen each other, to be sure. But I am back, at least for the time being. If you have missed my voice, I'm still posting every single day over on Red X, R-E-D-D-X, but I'm trying to get Dayton Dyes back into the rotation, so let's see how long we can keep the streak alive. This is My Property Isn't Normal, part number 5, by user Murderbird17, narrated by Brandon Dayton. My Property Isn't Normal, part 5. I usually try to do some kind of intro to these posts, but today I'm just too excited to take the time to do that. If you haven't read my previous posts, you should though. They're quite a bit more action-packed and explain all of the events that led me to where I am now. If you haven't read them, then you probably won't have any idea what it is that I'm talking about. Do you all remember last post when I joked about Mark being some kind of monster hunter or something? Well, I went through his computer and I'll be damned if he isn't. He's got files on files and even more files about these different tangibles, which I pretty sure just means monsters. I even managed to find a file on the key loot. No wonder they didn't believe that I had killed one. Apparently, a Kilut is a creature in Native American mythology that's described as a furless, dog-like thing. It does have fur on its paws, though, which supposedly makes it impossible to hear or track in the wild. Pretty tame so far, right? Well, don't worry, it gets better. Apparently, looking at them is just supposed to immediately fry your brain and disorient you, making you an easy kill for the creature. But that didn't happen to me, obviously. The only reason I can think of for the mind cooker effect not happening to me is because I just don't process things in the same way anymore. Not after the events that led me to live out here. Or maybe it wasn't even a key loot. There were a few more details that I didn't get to read because before I could finish, I felt cold steel on my neck. Mark had woken up and was now pressing a knife directly to my throat. What do you think you're doing with my computer? The fuck does it look like? I'm trying to figure out who the man that was passed out on my couch is. Mark thought for a second, still not removing the knife from my neck. Then he asked, Why? No. How did you knock me out? I know you have a dodgy history, but close quarter fighting is my specialty. But all I can remember is going to hit you, and then it went dark. Careful not to move and slit my own throat, I said. You got desperate, and you went for a one-hit knockout. Frankly, your left hook is too slow to hit your opponent when you clearly telegraphed exactly what you were planning on doing with your hips. I dropped under the blow and threw an elbow to the bottom of your jaw. The knife loosened a little. You seem to know your stuff. Why pretend to be a dumbass then? Uh, excuse me? First of all, I'm not pretending to be anything. Second of all, fuck you. <laughs> the knife fell away completely now. I took the opportunity to turn and start asking my own questions. So, you are an actual fucking monster hunter, huh? He paused for a moment before replying... Yeah, I guess I am. So, 
Why is an organization that employs monster hunters also the owner of an organization that's helping me escape my past? Mark winced this time. That is not a good sign. Cole, the organization that's claiming to help you escape your past probably doesn't exist. My organization has many false companies that it uses to gather intelligence and run experiments. I have reason to believe that they put you out here knowing about your past in an effort to see if anyone could survive in an area that's known for having extremely high levels of tangible activity. They also knew that if you were to die, they wouldn't have to worry about people looking for you. However, I also think that you have probably far surpassed their expectations. The higher-ups haven't told me so, but they can't possibly expect anyone to kill a Kelud on their own, or have fun with a creature like a flesh gate. Wow. Holy shit. That was a lot to take in. <laughs> I took a deep breath and then cautiously asked, What the fuck is a flesh gate? Mark put both of his hands on my head and let out a Rawr! Seriously, dude, does anything even phase you? Flesh gates are those things that you call pails. They're only like level four, but still too much for most people to handle, let alone fuck with on a regular basis like you claim to do. There goes that fucking level thing again. I'd seen various levels ranging from twos and threes all the way up into the hundreds on the report that I read while browsing Mark's computer, but I had no clue what they meant. Well, what's all this level shit about? All the monsters on your computer have one, but I don't know what they mean. Mark shot me an angry look. Guess he was still mad that I had gone through his shit. We base a beast's strength on how many unarmed adult men we predict it could take down before being overwhelmed. One man is equal to one level. Just then, I remembered that level beside the key loot, and it was 107. So, hold up. You're telling me that the key loot I killed was rated at... Before I finished, he interrupted me. 100 and fucking 7. No way. I knew about the mind-baking stuff, but that thing was no larger than a golden retriever. There was no way in hell it could kill 107 people. Your people predict that dog thing could kill 107 people? No, dumbass. They predict it could kill 106, and then it would lose at the 107th person. I had trouble believing him. Look, Mark. I read about how they can cook your brain when you look at them, but I stared that thing in the eyes, and it had no effect on me at all. Why? This seemed to puzzle him. I really don't know. And that's why I didn't believe it when I first heard that some dude claimed to have shot a key loot to death on Reddit. What really confused me is why the higher-ups decided it was worth getting a team to go and investigate. Now, I know that they're fully aware of the caliber of shit that happens out here. Speaking of caliber, can, can I see the gun that you used on the key loot? Damn it. I knew this was going to happen as soon as I mentioned the gun in my posts. The organization had a no guns rule for me, which is why it was a pretty big deal that the lady in the tree had helped me to get my hands on one. But now they knew and they weren't going to let me keep it. Fuck off, dude. I'm keeping my gun whether your bosses want me to or not. To my surprise, Mark looked genuinely confused by my sudden response. I don't want to take your fucking gun. I just want to see it. A normal pistol shouldn't be able to kill a key loot with one shot, no matter how perfect your aim is. I need to see what makes this gun different. And bring the bullets too. That's what I'm really interested in. He really didn't know about the rule that I'd been given about no guns. Okay, weird. I reluctantly went into my room and retrieved my trusty 45 caliber thunder stick and the only box of ammo that I had left. I started off with two large boxes of bullets, but over time my supply was whittled down to just half a box. As soon as I dropped the weapon and ammo onto the coffee table, Mark immediately started inspecting one of my bullets. Knew it. Do you even know what these are, Cole? 
Uh, 45 caliber? I responded, somewhat slowly. Without even looking up from the bullet, Mark began to explain. These are NAT rounds, specifically designed to deal with unholy creatures of chaos. They're created when the metals used to make the bullets are blessed by Native American shaman and medicine men. You can tell what they are by the slight warmth that they give off, and the small vibrations that you can feel when you squeeze them between your fingers. However, these are the most active rounds I've ever come into contact with. They're much warmer and vibrate much more than the rounds that I'm issued. If that lady in the tree gave you these, she's likely much more powerful than you realize. Mark looked up, maybe expecting some type of awe at this revelation. Well, that's, uh, that's neat, <laughs> I responded, somewhat dumbfounded. I guess it was cool to have enchanted bullets and all that, but it didn't really change much in the grand scheme of things. Kind of like how your car's speedometer goes up to 120 miles per hour. Most people won't ever drive that fast, but it's cool to know that when the time comes, you might be able to. Then again, I guess that the magic bullets came in handy when I shot the key loot, as well as a few other things, so maybe I should be more grateful. Before Mark could scold me again for my lack of reaction to his astounding observations, we were interrupted by a knocking on the door. We looked over to see one of the three guys that Mark had been working with when he first arrived. Through the window in my door, we could see him frantically beating on the wood and looking over his shoulder. Mark, it attacked the van! Holy shit, Jack is dead! And Phillips is hurt bad! Come, help me carry him back, please! Mark started to jump up and then caught himself. Cole, this thing is good. <laughs> it almost got me a second time. Shit, and it almost got me with the fucking help me technique as well. I started to smile. At least Mark wasn't a complete dumbass. I watched Skinny as he began that stupid grin that he always did when he got figured out, and then he darted off. Not much has happened over the past few days, and... I'm starting to get used to my new roommate. I'll still keep y'all posted, though. Something wild is bound to happen sooner or later, especially with those patrols that Mark keeps making us go on. Cole, signing off for now. I think one of the things that I like most about this entire series is that it provides a lot more questions than answers. I've always had some interest in the lady in the tree, but how about this government organization out here raiding creatures? I'm sure there have been many people like Cole before who simply didn't make it as long on this property that isn't normal. How long can Cole possibly make it? What exactly is the end game here? Just to go out and catalog them all like some freakish version of Pokemon? <laughs> A ridiculous idea to be sure, but... When it comes to government agencies, I don't suppose you can write anything off. Anyways, I'll see you guys again quite soon. Thank you if you're still here listening. I promise that I will be more consistent in the coming days. So, I will see you then, friends. And until then, keep yourself safe out there. Bye-bye. We're back again. Thank you so much for joining us. My property isn't normal. Part 6. Written by user Murderbird17. Narrated by Brandon Dayton. Well, last post I said something wild was bound to happen sooner or later, and I wasn't disappointed. Mark's been living here for about a week now, and he finally got what he was looking for. Action. Wasn't really in his favor, though. I mentioned the patrols that he keeps taking me on last post, but I didn't really go into detail. He calls them patrols, but honestly it's more like a scavenger hunt. He even gave me a damn list, like a little kid or something. On the list were specific signs and objects that are indicative of tangible activity. Tangible is fancy talk for monsters. I asked him what an intangible was as a joke, and he nonchalantly said, Ghosts, and other shit that you can't touch. After I realized he was serious, I popped the question. Then, why not just say monsters and ghosts and shit? 
He thought about that one for a moment before saying, because uh, the people who name this stuff are nerds. Well, fair enough, I guess. <laughs> there I go, off on a tangent again. Uh, back to the scavenger hunt. The list that he gave me had a lot of stuff on it. And as I was walking through the woods for the second time that day, one thing on the list kept catching my eyes. Stairs? Why the fuck would stairs even be on this list? That's not paranormal at all. Also, if there had been stairs in the woods, I would have already found them. That's not something that you just miss. I mean, I thought this whole search around for stuff idea was stupid from the beginning anyways. I never searched for the hell spawn on this property. They always just found me all by themselves. The only reason I even participated in Mark's patrols were to humor him so he wouldn't be as crabby. And besides, I like to get outside anyways. Even so, stairs. I was looking at the list, eyeing the word stairs for the millionth time when it suddenly got dark. Confused, I looked up to see that it actually hadn't gotten dark, I was just in a shadow. A shadow that was being cast by a tall, skinny, wooden wall. I had been to this exact spot a few days earlier, and there had been no such object here. The wall was about five feet wide and maybe ten feet tall, and I somehow almost walked directly into it without even realizing. I began to walk around it and quickly realized that it wasn't a wall. Yep, you probably already guessed it. It was the back of a fucking flight of stairs. I was honestly just shook. It was like I had summoned them after thinking about them too much. I immediately called Mark on the radio that he had given me for situations like this. And I yelled, dude, I actually found stairs. Like real freaking stairs out here. I hadn't been this excited about something in a long time and I really had no idea why I was so excited now. I think it had something to do with me thinking that stairs were just such a stupid thing to look for, only to end up finding some when I never expected to. Either way, I barely heard Mark respond with, Okay, just stay put for a minute. I'll be there soon. And please stop screaming. You're scaring away all the... things... out here. He said something else, but I wasn't listening. I was far too engrossed in these stairs. I had to go up them. It wasn't like they were calling to me or anything. It was more the fact that I was pretty sure I'd be able to see my house from the top. So with Mark still saying unintelligible commands on the radio, I began to ascend. As I walked up the stairs, the woods around me started to quiet down. Which is weird in retrospect, but I didn't really pay any attention to that. Another thing I noticed was that there wasn't any leaves or dirt or anything on the steps. Anyone who has experience in the woods knows that it only takes a few hours for Mother Nature to spread her shit all over any given objects that's left in her care. The real anomaly happened when I hit the top step, though. See, the second my heel hit the top step, I heard Mark let out a, What in the son of a bitch? And I froze. I started weighing my options. If I let whatever was out there just kill Mark, I wouldn't have to deal with him anymore. I also told myself that I wasn't going to kill people anymore. Does it really count as killing him if I just let him die, though? Hmm. I mean, they'd probably just replace him anyways. I guess I'll go and help. And with that thought, I went to go help him. I honestly expected there to be a pail clamped onto his foot or for him to have fallen into one of Camo's traps, but alas, all I found was Mark, without shoes on, just socks, clenching the toes of each of his feet in his hands. Before I could even ask what was going on, he stuttered, You, you went on the damn stairs, d didn't you? Yeah, and why does that matter? I'm telling you, if looks could castrate. Bad shit happens when you go up the stairs, you dick. I told you over the radio not to go up them. Oh, must have missed that part. What happened to you anyways? Now, this part is kind of nasty. 
Mark let go of one of the end of his socks to reveal that the toe area was covered in blood. He then removed the sock, and I shit you not, all of his toenails were gone. Damn, how'd you manage that? Are you daft, Cole? You did this when you went up those stairs! Yeah, sounds stupid, I know, but I do kind of believe him. Because I know for a fact that those stairs were not normal. I'm certain of this because when I went back to where they were to show Mark, who was limping something awful, they weren't there anymore. Just disappeared. Mark wasn't surprised by this either. And in case you were wondering, I could not see my house from the top of the stairs, which was a pretty big bummer. <laughs> That's about it for the stairs, but something else did happen yesterday, the day after the stair incident. I actually met a brand new monster. Well, it's new to me anyways. I think Mark knew what it was, but he won't tell me. Definitely gave him the spooks though. As you may have gathered, it happened on one of Mark's patrols. He was actually adjusting to life without toenails pretty good, I'll give him that much. The night before, he took a large amount of bandages and some rubbing alcohol from my bathroom. Guess he did a good job on himself because he was walking pretty close to normal now. I did hear a lot of groaning and heavy breathing that night in my living room though. I hope it was him patching himself up and not him having fun on his laptop, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Anyways. We were walking through an area of the woods that stays somewhat dark during the day due to the dense tree cover blocking out most of the sun. Other than the complete lack of light, everything seemed pretty docile. That was until Mark started complaining about a noise. Cole, you hear that? Uh, I think it's like static or something. What? No, I don't hear a th Mark put a hand on my chest to stop me mid-sentence. I look over at him to see what's up, and he is staring at me with extremely wide eyes. We need to get in the house, now! I had never seen him get this flustered, so I knew that things were serious. I nodded, and we both turned to run to the house, but the tall man was already blocking the way. Now, when I say tall man, I mean really, really tall man. I'm also fairly certain that he wasn't actually a man, Tall man just makes a pretty good name. He was between 10 and 12 feet tall, and he was wearing clothes made out of what looked like dirty brown and tan rags just stitched together. These rags covered his whole body, including his hands, feet, and face. He was also thin, but something deep in my gut told me that he held some kind of unnatural strength. As his image sank into my brain, I heard Mark whisper, Holy shit! It's really one of them. Off to my left. There was a complete silence for a while. I'm not sure how long. The only thing I could hear was a slight static, buzzing sound. No one moved in the silence. Not Mark. Not me. Not the pail that was about to bite into Mark's leg while he was distracted. Wait, holy shit, Mark, look out! Pail on your right! With surprising speed, Mark pulled out his Glock and put two shots into the pail's head. It didn't move after that, but the tall man definitely did. The sudden scuffle seemed to have set the tall bastard off into a rage, and the once subtle static sound grew into a roar. It was like no sound that I had ever heard before. Maybe something like the sound of metal being ground up by other metal. However, the sound was the least of our worries. The tall man started sprinting at us. It was originally about 30 yards away, but seemed to cover the distance in a blink of an eye. He was on us before either of us could react. He went for Mark first, reached out for him with one of those long, skinny arms. His fingers seemed to stretch out just so that they could reach all the way around Mark's torso. As Mark was lifted off the ground, kicking and yelling, he emptied the rest of his clip into the tall man's head. It did nothing. That's about the time when the big black tentacles ruptured out from the creature's back. Six new weapons now ripping holes in the rags. This thing must have been terrible at making its own clothes. Like, how hard would it be to just make tentacle holes so you don't end up ripping your shirts, right? 
<laughs> Anyhow, I really didn't want this big fella ripping up Mark, so I had to figure something out. Before it managed to completely obliterate old Marky, I drew my gun and emptied my own clip into various parts of the monster in an effort to find the weak spot. No luck. In fact, the bullets freaking bounced off of him. One of them whizzed right past my ear. It was like under those rags he was made of steel. But I'm no quitter. I now had his attention and I'm pretty sure Mark was growing unconscious at this point because he couldn't breathe due to this thing's death grip. I drew out my brand new Bear Grylls survival knife and lunged with all my strength at its leg. But I didn't stab it. If bullets can get through this thing's skin, I mean my knife didn't have a chance, but I did have a plan. I got behind it, only to get snatched into the air by one of the tentacles. I was immediately faced to, uh, rags with this thing. Its tentacle was wrapped tightly around my stomach. It now had Mark and I both exactly where it wanted. I swear I could hear a deep demonic laughter within the still roaring static that filled my brain, but it stopped laughing when I started. I began scream laughing. I'm not really sure why. Sometimes I think I might actually be insane. The tall man cocked his head off to the side as if saying, You do know you lost, right? The only thing that I was able to say before the last of the air was squeezed out of me was, I really hope this fucking works. And with that, I took the knife that was still in my hand and sliced at the tentacle as hard as I could. My hope was that since the tentacle could move so fluidly, the skin would have to be softer and weaker, otherwise it would be stiff and not flexible. Oh, how right that theory was. I was met with a spray of hot black liquid, and the static sound morphed into the sound of nails on a chalkboard. I fell seven or eight feet right to the ground and landed flat on my back. That shit hurt, of course, but adrenaline is a hell of a drug, so I was back on my feet almost immediately. Two things I noticed off the bat. It was still holding a now unconscious mark, and my attack hadn't quite managed to slice through the entire tentacle. But I was close. The thing seemed to be deciding on whether to retreat or try to kill me again. I took advantage of his slight hesitation and leapt at the now limp tentacle. I grabbed it and yanked with all the force that I could muster. Now it was completely severed from the beast. Suddenly, all the sounds in my head stopped, and I heard Mark hit the ground off to my right. I looked up only to see the tall man's covered head aimed at its now disconnected appendage, then at me, then at the woods behind him, then at me again, then at his tentacle again. Something tells me he's never been injured before. After he finished, uh, looking at stuff... He bolted backwards just as fast as he'd approached us before. Yeah, he sprinted off backwards. What is it with these fucking monsters and running backwards? Seems silly to me and pretty dangerous. Anyway, I ended up having to carry old Mark over my shoulder back to the house and he could stand to lose a few pounds. He woke up a few hours later and interrogated me on how I had managed to scare the thing off after he had passed out. I told him I just ripped off my clothes and started running at the thing until it ran off. Mark said that he won't let me see that thing's file until I tell him what really happened, but I do want to sell the naked story. <laughs> maybe I'll tell him what really happened later and let you all know the name of the creature, or maybe I'll just keep trying to convince Mark that while he's a monster hunter, I am a monster predator. That's about it for now, though, guys. I'll post again soon. In case you were wondering, I haven't seen Skinny in a few days and still haven't heard from the lady in the tree in a while, but life does go on, right? Be sure to check out the other parts of these stories. I have links below. And until next time, Cole, signing off. Well, I gotta admit that magical stairs that appear in the woods and rip off all your friends' toenails are interesting. I'm a lot more interested in the encounter with Tall Man. He was actually pretty slender as well. Hmm. Would Slender Man be a better name?
That name does sound kind of familiar to me for some reason. I really wish that Cole could have scooped up that tentacle off the ground, but then I don't think that the tall man would have let him escape so easily. Surely one of the most literal examples of giving up your life for science. So perhaps he did make the right choice and once again kept Mark out of danger. You'd think Mark would start to show him a little bit more respect at the very least. But as it is, we will be back again with yet another creepypasta story tomorrow. I do hope that you'll join me for it, friends. And uh, keep yourself safe out there in the meantime. No one quite knows where the tall man is lurking. I'll see you in the next one. And until then, friends, bye-bye. Well, seems like we got a pretty good thing going. Been consistent three days in a row. I don't want to jinx anything, but thank you guys all so much for patiently awaiting my return. <laughs> you knew I would be back at some point, even if I didn't necessarily know it. So, again, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Today, we are reading My Property Isn't Normal, part number seven. Narrated by Brandon Dayton, written by Murderbird17. So, Mark got possessed. It was a new experience for me, honestly. Also, I think we're going to have to deal with Skinny soon. He destroyed a van the other day that was carrying supplies out to us. I'll get to that part later, though. I actually learned a lot from the spirit that possessed Mark before it left, and yes, it did leave. I didn't have to banish it or anything. Let me just tell the story before I end up spoiling something. The day after the tall man incident, refer to part 6 for more information on that, Mark started acting funny, but in a good way, at least in my opinion. He was much less commanding and hostile, like he just had no energy. This meant that he didn't want to go keep checking around the property for monsters constantly, and I was able to do what I wanted again without him complaining. When I noticed the change in his behavior, I thought of two reasons that could be causing Mark to act this way. One, maybe he was sick. Or two, he was being a little scaredy prick after being almost killed by the tall man. Turns out I was wrong on both of those accounts. After two days of Mark being reserved and borderline unresponsive on my couch, I knew that something was up. As much as I didn't want to admit it, Mark is a badass in his own right. He isn't the kind of person to crumble after a traumatic event. He's a fighter. I was aware of this unnaturally aggressive fight over flight response when he first encountered Skinny and almost rushed out to his certain death just to show Skinny that he wasn't here to play games. On top of that, he didn't really show any real signs of sickness. He was tired and slow to respond, yes, but he wasn't sensitive to light like he had a concussion. He wasn't hot or cold, no runny nose, no trouble breathing, etc. It was on the third day of this strange behavior, yesterday, when I confronted him and got an answer. So, uh, Mark, any idea why you're so, like, tired and lazy and shit? <laughs> Just as I finished asking this, Mark shot up into a sitting position on the couch and whipped his head around to face me. In a voice much higher than his regular voice, he exclaimed, I thought you would never ask. <laughs> I finally finished taking over this body a few hours ago, and I was waiting for the right moment to reveal myself. You see, Mark is on vacation right now, and I'm taking his place. Oh, nice. Uh... When will he be back? <laughs> His wide smile quickly found itself upside down. You know what, Cole? This is really why I hate you. You're literally no fun whatsoever. Well, if you aren't Mark, then I don't know ya. And if that's the case, then how would you know that I'm not fun? Don't you know it's wrong to judge a book by its cover? Mark's, or no... Actually, the replacement Mark's voice was starting to sound irritated. I'm a ghost, dipshit. I've been here for months, just trying to fuck with you. I even tried to possess you, but unfortunately for me, you seem to be incompatible. 
And no matter how hard I tried to get your attention or scare you, I was always met with you just brushing it off. I worked really hard, too. Like that time I moved the TV while you were watching, or, or the time I put holes in all your socks to make your big toe pop out. <laughs> <laughs> I was finally starting to catch on to what was happening at this point. Oh, I thought the TV was just the way- Holy shit! You're the one that put holes in my socks? You piece of cock meat! You made me think that I had sandpaper toes! <laughs> he chuckled a little. Well, uh, at least that one worked anyway. As you probably already knew, being a ghost has its limits. It's extremely difficult to have any effect on the physical world, and we can't affect living tissue in any kind of direct way whatsoever. But now, I finally have a vessel, and I can finally kill you! Well, shit. That escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. <laughs> As I process the new information that I had just received, Fake Mark speaks up again. One thing I bet you didn't know is that as a ghost, when I take over a body, I can't see all of the host's memories, but the body still retains any natural reflexes and skills that the host has acquired through his or her lifetime. And this guy, he has some seriously badass skills. Fake Mark then sprang to his feet and did a roundhouse kick that shattered a nearby lamp into a million pieces. He then turned to my wall and punched it as hard as he could. I'm pretty sure he expected to punch right through it, but ended up only leaving some bloodied knuckle prints. Yeah, there's a, there's a stud there, I said, <laughs> as Fake Mark doubled over holding his damaged hands. I now realize that. Thank you. He wheezed out before standing up straight again. Even so, this guy is plenty skilled enough to end your sorry ass, Fake Mark shouted with a wicked grin. You must have been out here the first night that he got here, but okay, if you say so. Fake Mark cocked his head a little after this comment, then quickly brushed it off and lunged at me. I'm trying to explain what happened next as best I can. As he rushed at me, he threw a right-handed jab at my head. I countered this by hooking my arm over the inside of his shoulder with my left arm as I ducked the punch and put my right arm between his legs so I could lift him right off the ground. I then did a fireman throw, which basically means that I tossed him into the air and subsequently slammed him back onto the ground by exploding back up into a standing position and releasing my hold on his leg while still keeping a strong grip on his shoulder. This made Fake Mark fly over my head and slam onto the ground at my feet. I wanted to explain how this happened, just so people don't accuse me of bullshitting. And for the record, I don't think this would have worked on real Mark. I'm sure you would have seen this one coming. Anyways, this should have knocked the breath out of him. So, I was not ready when he punched the back of my knee and dead-legged me so perfectly that I went straight down on my ass. Middle school me would have taken notes on perfect execution of this move. Fake Mark ended up getting back to his feet before me, unfortunately, and jumped on top of me, putting me flat on my back. Fake Mark then reeled his fist back for a final blow. As his fist flew towards my face, I managed to move my head to the side at the last second, and his fist connected with the hardwood floor at a respectable speed. He might have been able to recover from this mistake pretty quickly, if that hadn't been the same hand that he had already smashed on the wall a few moments before. As Fake Mark winced at the pain, I threw my leg into the air and proceeded to connect with his no-no square. It was more effective than the slam from earlier, that's for damn sure. I stood up slowly while Fake Mark tried to decide if he should use his remaining good hand to grab his crotch or his shattered knuckles. Before he could decide, I grabbed his Glock that was sitting on the coffee table and took aim. Didn't take Fake Mark long to look up and realize that I now had complete control of this situation. He stood up, but didn't make any further advances at me. He instead opted to put on a pouty face and plop down in my recliner in defeat. Then it hit me. 
Why are you afraid of dying? That isn't even your body. You can't die again, can you? Fake Mark snapped back in a still somewhat aggressive tone. If this body dies while I'm in it, I'll get sent back. And I don't think I'll be able to escape again if that happens. Why are people always so vague when I ask a question? Escape from where? That's an important detail. I fully expected Fake Mark to snap back again, but all he did was look me directly in the eyes and mumble, Hell. The absolute terror on his face seemed genuine, and usually I try to stay respectful and patient when someone is in an emotional state like that. Unfortunately for Fake Mark, he wasn't a person. He was a ghost that was possessing my, uh, acquaintance. And I really don't appreciate that very much, so I continued on with my questioning. How did you escape from hell the first time? Fake Mark was surprisingly cooperative now. I found a gateway, and I walked through it. I ended up on this land. I think there's some sort of portal to hell around here. It seems that it's mostly ancient creatures that come out, though, instead of regular spirits. Only thing I can figure is that they were banished to hell, only to be let out at this exact location. Damn, I was expecting a badass story about a battle with the devil, not an actual plausible cause for all the crazy shit that goes on around here. Well, you seem to know your stuff, so... Why do I get the idea that you know a lot more about hell and monsters than the average lost soul? I was a preacher in life. Then why were you in hell? Because I studied the occult in my spare time. And I skimmed out of the donation bowl. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that makes sense. I guess God is cheeky like that. But what makes you think that all the weirdos in these woods come from a portal to hell? Fake Mark then started speaking in a more relaxed and confident manner. Not all the beasts out there come from the portal. Actually, most of them don't. Just some of the particularly nasty ones. You met one the other day. I think you call him the Tall Man. He's a recent immigrant. I, I think he got banished in the 70s by some monster hunting group. He was one of the more average ones, but you already know the most powerful one, don't you? At this, Fake Mark started grinning. He was right. I knew exactly who he was talking about. Oh, it's that Chuck Hulu guy from the Chosen Warship, isn't it? Fake Mark's grin transformed into a grimace. Holy hell, Cole. I seriously fucking despise you. It's that thing you call Skinny! Cthulhu is a cosmic entity from another plane of existence, separate from Hell! Skinny, on the other hand, is absolutely a product of Hell! So, he's a demon then? No, not a demon, but an amalgamation of at least a few other creatures that I'm pretty sure old Lucifer created himself. If I had to guess, Lucy's planning to take over the mortal plane and is throwing out some creatures here to test the waters before his final assault. Shit, that isn't good. I might be on his bad side since I keep mooning Skinny. Also, do you know what Skinny is? No, but I do know that he doesn't seem to be able to enter a home without being invited in. And that when he takes the appearance of something, whether a sumo wrestler or a baby rabbit, he maintains the same weight and strength as his regular form. And how do you know he stays the same weight? Because I once saw him spying on you as a squirrel, only to snap the giant branch that he was perched on under his weight. He then proceeded to shred the trunk of the tree with his little squirrel claws until it fell over. All out of frustration. I remembered that tree. I thought it had been attacked by a family of six-legged beavers that lived down by the creek, but uh, I guess I was wrong about that. It was beginning to seem like Fake Mark was a serious asset when it came to knowing about the stuff around here. I'm also curious about what different monsters make up Skinny. If any of you have any ideas, feel free to comment them because I'm pretty clueless as of now. 
The invitation thing is from vampires, though, isn't it? I don't know. Sounds too cliché to really be true. Anything else you want to get off your chest, Preacher Man? I guess I hit a nerve with that question. Fuck you! I'm a woman! I'm tired of you being so damn clueless! What? I didn't know that women preachers were a thing. Again, poor choice of words, Cole. That's it! I'm leaving! We were practically screaming at each other at this point, which, in hindsight, was really unnecessary. Okay, to be fair, you don't look or sound like a girl while you're in Mark's body, and all I ask is that you answer one more question. Fine! She yelled. I'd been wondering about this since the beginning of the conversation, so I was ecstatic to get one more chance to ask. You said I was incompatible for you to possess. Uh, why is that? At this point, Fake Mark took on a serious expression. It either means that you're a descendant of some saint, or some godly power favors you. Or maybe... Uh, but no, it, it couldn't be that. And with that, Fake Mark seemed to pass out. Guess it was the spirit, the demon, leaving the body. Soon after, Real Mark started to wake up and ask... Oh, where he was. I told him it was a long story, but he should probably get some fresh air before I told him. When he grabbed my outstretched hand so I could help him up, I squeezed. While he yelled in pain, I calmly told him, You owe me a new lamp. <laughs> That's it for Mark's possession. He actually took the news pretty well. I think he's been possessed by something before. I kept the part about me being incompatible to myself. Not really sure why, it just didn't seem like something that I should share at the time. Things are heating up around here, something big is going to happen soon, and with the information that we got out of the spirit preacher lady, it's starting to look like me and Mark can't do this on our own. I think he called in backup, but he won't actually tell me for sure. He just keeps looking out the windows a lot. I'll update again soon. Cole, signing off. One thing that I do know is that the ethereal planes are rife with battle, even to this day, for human souls. Each and every one of us generally has four or five of those battles within ourselves every single day. The war, I don't know that it can ever be won, but attacking the actual mortal plane is a pretty big dick move for Satan. I don't think it'll work out in his favor. I always believe in the goodness of humans. As hard as that may be some days, but maybe it's not all humans on Earth that are keeping us safe. Maybe it's just coal. And if I have to put my sanity and eternal soul in the hands of somebody, I definitely wouldn't pick coal. <laughs> but sometimes you don't get to pick, you get what you get. This is definitely getting more interesting and starting to heat up. I hope that you guys will join me tomorrow for part number eight. Keep yourself safe out there, try not to wander through any hell gates, and I will see you in the next one. Until then, bye bye Welcome back again, my friends. Consistency is indeed key, as we are finding out, and I'm so happy to be with you once more. Today, it is My Property Isn't Normal, written by Murderbird17. Narrated by Brandon Dayton. Guys, I've got a good bit of explaining to do. I've lied to all of you on a few occasions now. I haven't lied about any of the creatures or ghosts or people though, so don't worry about that. But I have lied about how I acquired some of my possessions. As you all should know by now, I didn't purchase my 45 caliber handgun. It was gifted to me, somewhat indirectly, by a good friend. What I have not explicitly stated was that I didn't exactly buy my house or property either, although I'm sure that many of you have already figured that out though. What I'm getting at is that I was placed here. Three years ago I was approached by an organization while I was hiding out in a bar in Mexico. I have no fucking idea how they found me because even though I'd been shit-faced for about two solid weeks, I know for sure that no one in that area even spoke English, so I don't think I could have ratted myself out. 
I fucking tried to find someone, honestly. Also, the people I was hiding from are not paranormal in any way, and that's a story that I'm not certain I want to share right now, but I might share it later on. Anyways, this group approached me and made me an offer. Again, I had been shit-faced for two straight weeks, so my memory is a little spotty. From what I can remember, they said something about helping me to escape the problems that I had created with, uh, that group that I mentioned. Normally, I would have immediately suspected that they were the enemy in disguise, but again, drunk-ass me thought, wow, this is the greatest fucking thing that could happen. I mean, they were offering me a free place to stay, with a limited amount of monthly allowance to purchase food and whatever else I needed. I just kind of assumed that it was government-funded. Then again, the government thinks that I died like 12 years ago, I think. None of that really matters now, though. See, I pretty much figured out what really happened behind the scenes with a little help from old Mark. We'd been sharing a hospital room for the last week, so we had plenty of time to think. I'll get to how we got here pretty soon. I think this is gonna be a pretty long post. So, as much as Mark and I can figure, the organization that was offering me witness protection type services was actually a fake front that was run by the monster hunting group that Mark works for. Their goal was to find someone with above average survival skills to see how long a human could last in an area with a high concentration of fucked up things roaming around. Let me emphasize that the assholes that planned this experiment probably did not expect me to survive my first encounter let alone live out there by myself for three years. Then, when the key loot showed up, they got giddy. According to Mark, they've never been able to observe a dead key loot before the one that I killed. He sure knows how to make me feel special. <laughs> That's when Mark and his crew got sent out, and old Marky has been with me ever since. I think that was about four-ish weeks ago. But enough of all that theory shit. Let me tell you about the clusterfuck that put me and Mark in the hospital. That ghost preacher bitch from episode 7 that possessed Mark a while back only got about half of her facts right. I found this out when Mark and I decided to go to the home base of the local cult that lives on the back of my property. They call themselves the Chosen. I don't know what they were chosen for, but I do know for sure that no one in that ragtag group of dipshits should be chosen for anything but extermination. They've tried to sacrifice me three different times now. The last attempt, they went as far as attempting to try and burn down my house, but I caught them in the act and convinced their leader, a short Latino man named Hector, to not bother me anymore. I really didn't want anything to do with them because they're so... awkward. But Mark was certain that they probably have some information about why more deadly creatures seem to be popping up at a higher rate. And maybe they have some knowledge about Skinny. I tried to convince him that I knew more than the Chosen when it came to Skinny, but he insisted that I was about as observant as Helen Keller, whoever the fuck that is. <laughs> so there we are standing in front of their little shanty town that they call the Ponderosa. It's mostly made up of metal sheds and parts of mobile homes. Yes, parts. And there are people living inside with whole walls missing. Keep in mind that these people aren't poor. Almost all of the members have nice cars and trucks parked outside of their homes. A new Chevy Silverado, nice Ford Mustang, Many others that I don't know the name of off the top of my head. I don't really understand what philosophy leads them to living happily in a shithole like this, but to each their own, I guess. We found Hector pretty quickly. He was in the middle of the squalor, preaching about something or other. He noticed me and Mark almost immediately, probably due to the fact that neither of us were wearing dark robes like the rest of the cultists. Mark was wearing black combat pants and a great long sleeve t-shirt that made him look like he meant business. I, on the other hand, was wearing blue jeans and a Twizzler t-shirt. <laughs> Hector stated somewhat solemnly, I guess we have guests now, and proceeded to step off of his upside-down five-gallon bucket. As he approached, 
Mark whispered just loud enough for me to hear, They're surrounding us. And sure enough, he was right. I look around to see not only Hector approaching us, but about 60 different cultists approaching us from different directions. They were closing in, and both Mark and I prepared to draw our weapons to defend ourselves when Hector called out, Children, calm down. Don't you see he's got a gun now? Let's please try not to get on his nerves now. I could see Mark start smirking out of the corner of his eye, but I didn't have the heart to tell him that they weren't talking about him. Look, Mr. Uh, Hector, right? We were just wondering if you had any idea about where some of the paranormal creatures in this area are coming from. This question seemed to make Hector uncomfortable. We haven't been seeing anything like that around here, so... Just then, one of the black-robed cultists came bursting through the surrounding crowd. Great Bishop Hector! The baby doll spider! It came back! At this revelation, Hector knew that we knew that he knew what we wanted to know. You get all that? <laughs> all he could do was look back and forth from his distraught follower and us. He finally decided to just awkwardly smile at us. As much as Mark wanted to continue questioning, we both noticed that the cultist that came back was missing large chunks of his robe and his flesh. While the man stood there hyperventilating in front of his leader, Mark pointed something out to me. Cole, he's holding a severed hand, he whispered. We didn't want anyone to overhear us while all the focus was on Hector trying to console this hysterical man. I responded to Mark's observation with, look, if this thing is coming, we might have to put the skinny hunt on hold. As much as these people are a nuisance, I really don't want to see a whole community get slaughtered. Mark shot a conflicted look at me. I agree, but we aren't prepared for a fight with something like that. While we were talking, I felt a tap on my shoulder. It was Sonia, Hector's second in command. I hadn't seen her since the last time I was in their little neighborhood, and I hadn't really left on a good note. Now she looked deadly serious. Cole, we have all the information you want, and... Some that you probably don't, but before I tell you, we're going to need your help. This thing is going to tear us to shreds, but I have a way that we might be rid of it. Sonia was the only member of the Chosen that struck me as somewhat smart. I think she was raised into a cult, and that was the only reason that she hadn't left. In some twisted way, it was her only family. Before Mark could protest, I answered, We're in, so what do we... I was interrupted before I could even finish my sentence by a loud screeching. The sound was beyond unnatural. I could describe it as a young woman screaming in terror, but the tone kept changing instantly, like some sort of shitty auto-tune from hell. <laughs> Mark and I looked at each other. Fuck. Fuck indeed, Mark. Fuck indeed. <laughs> I looked back to ask Sonya what she planned on doing, but when I looked in her direction, she was already sprinting off. I really hoped that she was grabbing some sort of secret weapon and not just being a coward. I didn't have time to dwell on those thoughts, though. That's the beast, cresting the hill, Mark said, as he jerked my attention back to the situation at hand. Sure enough, as I looked through the trees that led uphill, I could see a mass of tan, white, and dark red charging down the hill. As it got closer... The cultists started running around wildly. Some pulled out spears and knives, but that looked kind of like they were just trying to use chopsticks for the first time. Obviously, they weren't going to be much help. I was starting to make out some details on the thing as it approached. The main defining feature of the baby doll spider was that it was in fact made of what looked like baby dolls. Not just dolls, though. Mannequins. Cosmetic practice heads. It seemed like all of the different objects were held together by some magic stickiness. I disagree with calling it a spider, too. It had four legs and two arms. It was shaped more like a centaur. Another odd detail was that each body part was made up of that specific body part. Where the head should be, there was a mass of mannequin doll and other forms of heads that were just crammed together. 
The same rule follows for the legs, the arms, the torso, and so on. Mark, what the hell's that thing? I don't know. Usually if you see a doll or something moving around, that's a possession, but this... This is something else entirely. That lady you were talking to better have a good idea. The abomination was now closing in and had reached one of the outermost sheds that dotted the Chosen's headquarters and began tearing it to pieces. I don't think guns are going to work on this thing. I bet it doesn't have internal organs that a bullet could damage and I doubt it'd respond to nat rounds since it doesn't even look Native American. We're going to have to use stuff that will break it the old-fashioned way, Mark said as he grabbed a spear from a nearby cultist and slung it at least 40 yards to hit the thing in the torso. What the fuck? Mark can throw spears now? <laughs> Even though it was a solid hit, the monster didn't reel back at all. It just looked in our direction and let out another screech before charging us at full tilt. It was at about this point that I realized that the beast was not actually colored red anywhere on its body. All of that deep red that I had seen was just blood that was caked onto the baby doll centaur. Damn it, doll spider sounded better. <laughs> As it got closer, Mark yelled, Get its attention! I got an idea! I nodded and pulled out my forty-five pistol, knowing that it wouldn't kill it, but I could at least try and distract it. I now realize that I'm actually starting to trust Mark with my life, something that I haven't done with another person in a very long time. I started hitting center mass as the creature neared ten yards away from Mark. He now stopped and turned towards me. Mark took advantage of this brief pause and sprinted at the creature. I was confused by this until I saw the round thing in his hand. Grenade. I kept firing and Mark slid under the belly of the beast and plunged his hand in between the parts that made up the creature's torso, then continuing to slide his way out from the other side. As he got back to his feet, he yelled, COVER! and dove behind a nearby Cadillac. All the creature had time to do was start to look over in Mark's direction before it was obliterated by a teeth-rattling explosion. Hundreds of plastic body parts rained down everywhere. That may have been the most badass thing I have ever seen. It's really a good thing that Mark started carrying grenades with him everywhere since the tall man incident. Cheering began erupting from all around the compound, but the celebration was short-lived. As I jogged over to check on Mark, I noticed that the body parts were still moving. Not only that, but they were all moving towards the same central point. The yells of joy started dying down as more people began to realize that this thing was just putting itself back together. Just as Mark started to grab for another grenade concealed somewhere on his body, I heard the familiar voice of Sonya screaming my name. Cole, take this! The woman that lived in the trees said you'd know what to do with it! With that, she tossed me what looked like an oversized minnow catching net. That didn't make a whole lot of sense. There's no way in hell that this thing would be afraid of a net like pails were, even if it was bigger. All of my doubts melted away, however, when I caught the net. Sonya was right. I did know exactly what to do. A wave of something came over me when my fingers made contact with that net. It was like an absolute certainty or something, but I wasn't sure exactly what I was certain of, if that makes sense. I looked down at the net and realized that where the weights were supposed to be on a normal minnow net, this one had medium-sized rocks. On these rocks were symbols, or runes of some sort that I didn't recognize. They would have been hard to see on the rocks if they weren't glowing a bright blue color. Mark looked at me with a stare of confusion, then snapped back to reality and commanded, Get your ass in gear and use that thing! I bolted in the direction of the now half-formed doll spider and slung the net over the wriggling mass of body parts. Nothing happened. The body parts kept moving back into place, and the net didn't seem to phase the thing. Well, shit, <laughs> I could hear Mark say to himself from behind me. And then it hit me. It was like I remembered something that I had never even learned. Before I knew what I was doing, the word RAKULUCHA escaped from my mouth. 
Immediately, all at once, the blue runes changed into a deep red, and smoke started rising from the net. The beast managed to get one more half screech in before it, well, it just kind of stopped existing. While the cheering started to erupt again among the cultists, I immediately approached Sonya. Something she had said when she first approached me was hanging heavily on my mind. So, do you mind explaining why you called her the lady that lived in the trees and not the lady who lives in the trees? I said, with more force than was probably necessary. Look, Cole, I know that you need to know. She came to me and explained everything. Yes, it's our fault that some of these beasts exist, but the shapeshifter needs to be dealt with now, and you're ready to take that task on. She came to me. Hector doesn't even know, and she was certain that you would be able to fix this. Please, just listen. The somber tone of the young woman's voice told me that my suspicions were true. The lady in the trees hadn't been hiding or avoiding me this whole time, and that was really hard to swallow. This was the beginning of a path to a dark place that I had not visited in years. I just truly hoped that Mark was willing to walk down that path with me. There's more to this story, but this entry's getting too long, so I'm going to cut it off here and post the rest of the story at a later date. Until then, Cole, signing off. Oh, R.I.P. to the lady in the tree. We hardly knew ye, you know? I guess a whole lot of this is just going to be left up to our own interpretation, because since Cole doesn't know exactly where she came from, how can we possibly know? I've got a few theories. She might come back around, but it also might take her a few hundred years in order to be able to do so. But man, that hellspawn the cultists cooked up, that was something horrible. I didn't think they actually had any power. I thought they were just crazy people that sacrifice other human beings in the woods, but no... It does seem that they're doing things. I guess that's why they have so many recruits. Once you see the power, you kind of want a part of it. Luckily, Cole was able to dismantle the power, but is a net really going to be enough to stop Skinny? <sighs> I guess we'll have to wait and find out. Thank you, as always, for joining me, friends. Don't forget to like, comment, and or subscribe if you are enjoying the content. I will be back again tomorrow with another Creepypasta video. Watch out for centaurs made of baby doll parts. <laughs> as ludicrous as it might sound, apparently it happens. <laughs> and I will see you in the next one. So until then, friends, bye-bye. Welcome back to it, friends. This will be our final ride through the property that is not normal. It was one year ago that I said it would take about a week and a half for us to blaze through this series. Well, that turned out to be a lie. <laughs> One year later, finally, we are getting it all wrapped up. We'll be moving into some other stuff. I've got a ton of really talented writers queuing up, um, mostly coming from my Red X content, R-E-D-D-X, as I've mentioned. We do a lot of Neckbeard stories over there, but it seems that Neckbeard stories have a lot of crossover with creepypasta authors. So I will be covering some of them in the days to come. I hope that you guys are looking forward to it. I'm really sad to see this series come to an end, but short and sweet, just how we like it. So let's not hesitate any longer. We'll go ahead and jump into it. My property isn't normal. Part nine, written by Murderbird17, narrated by Brandon Dayton. So, where did I leave off? Oh, yeah, that's right. I just found out that the one person on this godforsaken plot of land that I had considered to be on my side before Mark showed up is dead. That's right, folks. The lady in the tree wasn't mad at me. She wasn't ignoring me. She had been deceased for almost a year now. She's the one who really provided me with the means to survive over the past three years that I had. She gave me a gun with magic bullets. She gave me hearing in an ear that had been basically destroyed. She gave me antidotes, alcohol. I'm pretty sure she even did my laundry once. 
I also can't help but think that she had something to do with the fact that the spirit preacher couldn't possess me. The most important thing that she gave me, though, was her trust. Based on the few times that she had directly communicated with me, through letters, she always alluded to the fact that I was supposed to be the one to help cleanse this land of the supposed darkness. Like I was the chosen one or some shit. Whether I'm actually special or not, though, she trusted me. Absolutely. And I... I failed. In her mind, I was battling these monsters and scaring them away from here. I was the hero that she had been waiting on, for she couldn't fight the creatures directly due to some sort of oath. In reality, all I've done for the past three years was dick around and kind of get lucky. I've never gone out looking to solve the monster problems around here. Even when I set the trap for camo, that was purely selfish in reasoning. I was just annoyed by his constant attempts at trapping me. I didn't do it for the greater good of the land. Looking at my life, I've never really done much of anything to serve anyone else except for myself. Even the stuff I did after my dad was killed, I wasn't avenging him. I was getting revenge for myself. I don't know why she ever decided that I was the one who would make things right. What instincts had told her that I was the man that could finally change something. I really wish that she'd never decided on me in the first place because that fact alone is why, as I type this in my hospital bed, my throat is hurting and my lip is trembling. Actually, that might be the hospital food's fault. I'm not really sure at this point. Enough sad monologuing anyways. Time to get back to what happened. Sonia had some explaining to do, and I fully expected to get every ounce of useful intel from her. First question I needed answered was, what the hell happened to the lady in the tree? Sonia, what happened to her? She looked at the ground. It was obvious that she was dreading having to explain this to me. She snuck into what was left of my shelter in the middle of the night after Skinny attacked the Ponderosa. She told me... At this, Mark, who seemed to materialize from nowhere, cut her off. Look, I understand you want to get right to the part where the lady in the tree died, but first, there's some other questions that need answers. Why did Skinny attack in the first place? Do you know where he came from? Do you know how to stop him? I turned to argue with Mark because I was the one who wanted to get to the part where she died. But unfortunately, Mark was right. Yeah... As much as I want to hear about what became of the lady in the tree, we need to start from the beginning. Now, what was that you were saying about some of these monsters popping up were your fault? I guess Mark hadn't heard that part of the previous conversation, because now he looked at me with surprise etched into his face. Sonia was even slower to answer this time. Well, um, Cole, it wasn't my fault, per se. You know how stubborn and persistent Hector can be, right? I didn't really like where this was going, but I did have a pretty good idea. Yeah? I mean, he tried to kill me, what, like six times, I think? Without thinking, Sonya replied, nine. But that's not what's important. <laughs> what's important is that Hector has been trying to summon Cthulhu for years now. But in the last year, he's finally started having progress. Sort of. That's when Mark chimed in. What exactly does this progress consist of? The young cultist paused for a moment, deep in thought. Well, that attempt at summoning rituals started working, just not as we planned. Things were coming through the portals that we created. The things weren't what we meant to summon, though. So far, we've summoned a 15-foot-tall cloaked tentacle man that's been kidnapping our brothers and sisters on a regular basis until recently, that baby doll monster that you both just saw, and the spirit that keeps creating minor inconveniences like broken plates and shoelaces being stolen from their respective shoes. But the last thing that we summoned, and by far the most vicious, was the shapeshifter. I could not believe what I was hearing. So, 
let me get this straight. You people are responsible for the tall man, the ghost preacher bitch, the baby doll abomination, and skinny? Was there ever a point where you thought, damn, these rituals aren't helping us out very much. Maybe we should, I don't know, fucking stop? Sonia shrugged as she looked at me. This is Hector we're talking about. She had a point. Hector does not know when to quit. Mark decided to pipe up again. And what finally happened to convince you that these rituals were a bad idea? When the shapeshifter killed half of us, then only stopped after saying that he was going to take a nap and come back for the rest of us later. Yeah, that's a pretty solid reason, I said, after considering what she had said. So, was it during Skinny's nap that the lady in the tree came to talk to you? I asked. Yeah, it was a few hours after the attack. The community was absolute chaos. While Hector tried to calm everyone down, I was in my shed trying to figure out what I absolutely needed to take with me when I fled. That's when I heard a woman whisper, hey, to me. And it was her. I immediately knew she wasn't one of us, because, well, she doesn't wear much in the way of clothes, and we're obviously very strict about our dress code here. So, what did she want? This time, Sonya took a deep breath and closed her eyes before answering. She said that she had a way to save us from the shapeshifter, but she had a message and a few things that she needed to leave with me. After telling me this, she went back outside for a moment, and when she came back, she was carrying three large nets. She explained that the nets were for the man that lived up on the hill, you, and that I was to give them to you as soon as possible. She also said that she had thought of a way to keep the shapeshifter from attacking anyone again until you had a chance to deal with him. This revelation puzzled me. I knew for a fact that the lady in the tree couldn't directly attack or harm any creature as a part of an oath. Mark stayed silent, deep in thought. I, on the other hand, kept pressing Sonya for answers. So, why the fuck didn't you tell me any of this sooner? This information would have been useful, oh, I don't know, like a year ago. Sonya flinched as I finished my sentence. Honestly, Cole, I was... Just scared that if you saw me, you'd kick the shit out of me. Guess I can't blame her for that one. I did kick the shit out of Hector, right in front of her, only a couple of years ago. Okay, okay. Did she tell you how she planned on doing this? She never got the chance to. Before she could explain any further, we heard screaming along with the sounds of ripping metal outside. We rushed out to see a nine-foot-tall Ronald McDonald ripping someone in half while laughing like a madman. The Native American woman looked at me one last time and said, make sure to tell Cole that he alone can send these beasts back using those nets. He might not know yet, but he'll know what to do with them when the time comes. The elder spirits will guide and protect him. And with that, the Indian woman took off towards the shapeshifter, which was now a giant werewolf. As she got closer, she started screaming some words that I didn't understand. She also started glowing blue, which was odd. She finally got the shape. Just call him Skinny. It's catchier. Sonya seemed kind of annoyed that I had interrupted her, but she continued all the same. She got Skinny's attention when she stopped five feet in front of him. She was lit up like a blue glow stick at this point. She had stopped chanting and was just standing in front of Skinny, trying to catch her breath when Skinny said, Well, aren't you different? I never killed a glowing one before, and proceeded to casually swipe at her with a clawed hand. The Indian woman didn't flinch, but when the first claw made contact with her, there was a deafening boom, accompanied by an explosion of what looked like red mist. Skinny can vaporize people? I blurted, now a little more wary of my plans to attack the entity. Sonya was quick to set me straight, though. No, 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 no. She did something to herself with those incantations. Before that point, all Skinny had done was shred people into smaller portions of people. Mark muttered in response. 
probably some curse that she set on herself as a trap. So when Skinny attacked her, it would trigger. This would bypass her rule of not being able to cause direct harm to other creatures, since in a way, Skinny cursed himself by attacking her of his own will. Did anything change about Skinny's behavior after the lady in the tree, uh, you know? Mark slid his thumb across his throat in a slicing motion as he finished, and he glanced over to me with what looked like pity in his eyes. Yes, um, what's your name? His look of pity quickly turned to a look of annoyance. Mark, the expert said with a growl. Yes, Mark. His behavior did change. See, after the Indian woman disappeared, it only took a few seconds for Skinny to regain his composure. He almost immediately started laughing, and then he said, What the hell was that? <laughs> a suicide bomber attempt. Pathetic. However, as he lunged to grab yet another one of my sisters, he fell to the ground in writhing agony. He got up and tried again and again, but each time he attempted to attack someone, he was met with paralyzing pain. So, the curse makes it so that Skinny can't hurt anyone? I asked apprehensively. Because six months ago, Skinny smacked the dog shit out of me and I almost died. Not quite. See, the curse has one catch. We found that out when Martin, Cthulhu bless his soul, tried to take advantage of his inability to attack and launched an assault of his own. But when his baseball bat made contact with the creature, he was immediately struck down by a clawed hand. I slapped my palm against my forehead. Ah, oh, that makes sense. He can only attack you if you attack first. That's why he tries to get us pissed at him. He made it seem like he was trying to lure us outside to disguise the fact that he was actually trying to lure us into attacking him. Both Sonya and Mark looked at me, somewhat startled for a moment, before Mark spoke up. Cole, pardon me, but I'm honestly only used to you saying stupid shit, but I do actually think you're right this time. I started to argue, but quickly realized that he was right. But regardless, uh, fuck you, Mark. <laughs> so, do I kill or banish Skinny by tossing one of those nets on him and yelling whatever magic words come into my head? Wait, also, how the hell did I know what magic words to use? Sonya answered me with, Yeah, I don't really understand it either, but let's just roll with it. Just then, I heard Mark say, What the fuck? from right behind me. This was odd, since Mark had been standing in front of me for a few minutes now. I turned around, and sure enough, there was a second Mark behind me. This meant that either Skinny just walked up pretending to be Mark, or worse, he had been talking to us the whole time and now knew everything that we knew. Sonya and I both backed away from the Marks as they stared at each other in confusion, and then back at me. Mark on the left yelled, Throw the net on it! Now's your chance to end him! And the other one fires back, No! He's trying to trick you! Throw it on him, fast! After a moment of thought, I said, Okay. So I think I have a way to figure this out. Whichever one of you is the real Mark just has to punch the other Mark to prove that you can attack first. Both Marks shouted, But then he'll kill me! At this point, Sonya whispered in my ear, Damn, he's good. But I already knew what my next move was. Sonia, give me one of those nets. As she handed me one of the nets that was lying on the ground next to her, I started walking towards the marks until I was right in front of them. A wicked grin spread across my face as I said, All right, here's a question that only the real Mark would know the answer to. How did I get the tall man to run away? The mark on the left quickly responded, Uh, you cut off a tentacle, but couldn't Skinny have seen that? I now looked at Mark on the right to see how he planned to respond to the situation. All he did was squint his eyes at me and sigh, and then, in a defeated tone, he said, You took off all your clothes, and you ran at him naked until he fled. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's right, Mark. I did. Satisfied by his answer, I slung the net over the top of the leftmost Mark's head and yelled out the new magic words. Ekla ha chelrika! I'm not really sure why the magic words that came out of my mouth then were different from the ones that came out when I got rid of the baby doll monster, but like Sonya said, I guess we're just gonna roll with it. As the runes that were carved into the rocks that outlined the net started to glow and Skinny was swallowed by the smoke, I heard him utter, No fucking way! in a deep voice. Then... As the smoke that swallowed him was blown away by a breeze, he was gone. Pretty anticlimactic, right? <laughs> I was honestly hoping for some badass battle where we fought to the death, and I got to stab him with a magic wooden spear that was like the final gift from the lady in the tree or something while I said something really cool. But yeah, in the end, Skinny was defeated by an immature inside joke. <laughs> That's it. I mean, yeah, the tall man is still out there somewhere, but Skinny is done. The lady in the tree got her wish. That's all I could really hope to accomplish. Mark was pretty pissed off at me for putting his life on the line and risking sending him to another dimension on the basis of him remembering an inside joke. In response to his anger, I just told him that I had faith in him. And in the end, that's all that mattered. All he said in return was... Fuck you. I need a beer. <laughs> I didn't tell him how I'd really figured out who was real when they both said, but then he'll kill me in unison. You see, the new Mark that had just walked up shouldn't have known the rules of the curse since he hadn't been there to hear about him. All I can figure is that Skinny had probably been listening in, disguised as a cultist, and decided to enter the conversation and stop us before we came up with the plan to kill him. I really just wanted Mark to believe that I was dumb enough to put his life on the line for something that Skinny could have easily heard had he been eavesdropping at the right time. Serves him right for basically calling me a dumbass earlier. <laughs> After Skinny was dealt with, Mark and I shared an uncomfortable couple of goodbyes with the cultists, most of whom hadn't even noticed what had happened, including Hector, much less appreciated the fact that we just got rid of the single most vile creature that ever inhabited this land, but yeah, I was okay with that. The fact that the lady in the tree's killer was now gone for good was good enough for me. Some of you are probably asking, wait, if that's all that happened, then why were they both in the hospital? Well, that actually happened when the headquarters of the monster hunting organization that Mark works for summoned both of us to be interrogated about the events that led to the destruction of Skinny, who was what they knew to be an extremely high-level threat. After all the paperwork and questioning was over with, Mark offered to take me out for a drink, and I accepted. Long story short, don't drink and drive, kids. They even took away our electronics for the first week that we were in here. Claimed that it was so they could scan them, but really I knew it was just punishment for damaging a company armored SUV. Anyway, that's pretty much it for now. I'll try to keep posting, but now that Skinny is gone, the land seems a lot more relaxed. Hope y'all enjoyed the tale of how I finally killed Skinny. This is Cole, signing off. Anticlimactic, maybe, but beautifully told. I'm definitely glad that the lady in the tree finally got some posthumous revenge and that Cole was smart enough to put two and two together. It seemed like a sticky situation to me. I'm not sure how I would have figured my way out of that one, but I guess I'm just not as bright. As Cole says, perhaps my brain doesn't quite work in the right way, although it seems to put me at a severe disadvantage at this point. <laughs> There is one related story that Murderbird has posted, and we will get into that tomorrow, but this is officially the end for this series, aside from that one-off. But I do hope that you guys enjoyed it. If you did, I hope you like, comment, and or subscribe. Check out the links in the description. Primarily, any plugs or my social medias. Oh, and my Patreon, of course. I am very, very glad to be back. Making two videos a day is definitely difficult, but in the end... It's going to be worth it, and I thank you guys for being here with me. 
and supporting in the way that you do. I'll see you again tomorrow with another creepy pasta tale. Keep yourself safe out there until then. Try not to cast any curses on yourself. And I shall see you in the next one. So until then, bye bye. Welcome back once again, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Today we will uh, be wrapping up the last piece of the puzzle, I suppose, in the My Property Isn't Normal universe. This is The Origin of Mark the Monster Hunter, written by user Murderbird17, narrated by Brandon Dayton. So, Cole told me that a lot of people that read his stories wanted to know how I came into contact with and began working for the organization that I am currently with. After seeing how much fun Cole had writing those stories about his property, I gotta say I'm tempted to take a crack at writing. His suggestion to write about how I came into contact with the organization made me realize that, yeah, it's actually a pretty good story. Unfortunately, due to personal reasons and specific rules given to me by the organization, I will not be giving specific locations or names within this post. You know the drill. What I can tell you is that I was the second in command of a highly mobile task force based in North America. The team consisted of five members, and we all specialized in specific fields. While we all had training and experience, I was designated combat specialist at the time. Also note that all of our operations were completely off the book, and even if they were to come to light, they may cause some controversy. I've been fighting fights that no one knows about for a long time now. Maybe that's why I suddenly feel the need to share. Anyway, we get word from HQ that some operatives from another team had gone missing. They were all MIA. These are highly trained soldiers, and six MIAs with professionals of their level is unheard of. And unsettling. Orders come down a little later that we're to be deployed with another team of six to secure the area and find the bodies. Bodies? I thought they were missing in action. I'm beginning to think that the higher-ups know something that we don't, and the rest of my team felt the same way. Also, the reason that we have five members instead of six like the other teams is because our tech specialist had recently taken massive blunt force trauma to the head when thrown into the air by an exploding air compressor that was pierced by a stray bullet. He was recovering at the time of this mission. We didn't want anything to do with this mission, especially since we were a man short, but disobeying orders wasn't an option and we were just too proud. So we get to the site where the team went missing and it's in the middle of the woods. I start scanning the area for anything when one of the members from the other team calls in an abandoned cabin over the radio. They were dropped in on the other side of the search area and they came upon the house first. They then start to report spent shell casings that match the weapons that the MIA team was equipped with and blood. Lots and lots of blood. No meat or bone or bodies, just blood. And the blood led to a shattered window on the side of the cabin from what the other team was reporting. Then the gunshots started. Lots and lots of gunshots. We frantically called over the radio. Team 1! Team 1, report! Report! We can hear shots fired! No response. What the actual fuck is going on over there? No response. And now, no more gunshots. We were scared at this point, but we aren't wussies and we don't leave teammates to die. No choice but to move in. However, we never made it to the cabin. It was almost human. Not quite, though. It was small, too. It looked like a teenage human male with no hair whatsoever, and it had an off-white skin tone. It was pouring blood from what could have been hundreds of holes. Bullet holes. And while it looked human, it moved more like a monkey, on its fists and feet in a galloping motion. I'll be honest, we froze. We had been through a lot together, and I trusted these men and women with my life, but 
we froze. We were not prepared for any of this. It only looked to be a hundred pounds or so, but with the amount of damage that it had sustained, it shouldn't be able to move. But sure enough, move it did. It jumped to our commander, and with relative ease, ripped out her throat before she could scream. She was dead. I couldn't move and suddenly found myself on my knees. Everything was quiet for a moment. This is in no way supposed to sound cheesy or make you feel sorry for me, but it is a detail that's important because it's likely the only reason that I'm still alive today. Me and the commander were not just teammates. I'm not going to go into the details of how deeply we were connected because that is personal territory. However, I will say that earlier that week, she told me something that led me to begin looking at good school zones in our area. <sighs> I didn't want her on this mission, but she wouldn't take no for an answer. We were already a member short, and as commander, she had authority to do whatever the fuck she wanted. Stubborn asshole. You shouldn't be dead. Neither of you. I was still staring at the pieces of her when I was snapped back to reality by a shotgun blast. The sudden feeling of a small humanoid flying into me. It wasn't attacking, though. It had been thrown through the air by the blast of the shotgun, which was loaded with buckshot. It had been hit at point-blank range, too. Left a massive hole in the center of its chest. When I actually felt the thing touched me, that was when I completely snapped. It was still getting back to its feet when I got to the demo specialist's body. He was the one who had fired the shotgun, but he was missing both legs and large chunks of his torso, and he had bled out seconds after firing the shot. As I turned around, with a grenade in my hand, the little fucker was already flying through the air at me. I put all of my pure anger and hate into one punch. My hand went straight inside the hole, that had been created by the earlier shotgun blast. I could feel its warm, bloody insides, and even a few bullets that were lodged in the bones that were now cutting my skin. Fist still in its chest, I slammed the creature into the ground and ripped my hand out of its chest before it had the chance to rip off my entire arm. And then I ran. You see, among all the blood and flesh that was in my hand, there was something else. A pin. I had to survive for five seconds. I can hear the thing start to get up. Four seconds. I'm sprinting as fast as I can, but I can hear the crunching of leaves behind me. Three seconds. I trip over a log that I couldn't see thanks to the setting sun. Two seconds. I stand up and turn just in time to see the creature jump towards me for the second time. One second. I throw a wild left hook that sends the creature tumbling to my right and I drop to my stomach on the ground, covering my head with my hands. BOOM! The thing is gone. I stand up after a few seconds and realize that I have pieces of grenade shrapnel lodged in various body parts, but nothing vital. The sun is almost set by now, but I can hear an evac heli coming in my direction. We didn't have time to call for evac, but I didn't realize that at the time. Before I made my way to the clearing that we had agreed on evacuating from, if worst ever came to worst, and it did, I noticed that a piece of the creature's face was in front of me. I limped over and stomped on its still twitching eye, and then I made my way to the clearing. The chopper that landed was not an evac chopper. It was a Black Hawk helicopter with no identifying markings. As it landed, four men jumped out and approached me. They were all wearing some kind of black armor, and they caught me as I began to fall to the ground. They then carried me to the helicopter. As they pulled me in, I heard one of the men, already sitting inside, say, I can't believe he actually fucking did that. You guys sure he isn't a tangible? And then I passed out. A few days later, I woke up in a hospital bed, in a room with no windows. Minutes later, I'm approached by an older man. He informs me that we are within an organization that takes care of problems that other organizations can't, and that I had managed to kill a beast that had been deemed a level 49. 
I later learned that the levels meant the estimated amount of unarmed adult men that it would take to defeat or kill the monster. He then informed me that they were interested in recruiting me. I attempted to ask him if any of my teammates had survived, but I couldn't speak. The man saw me struggling to talk and explained that when they had found me in the clearing, I was yelling my head off and had not stopped until I passed out. Apparently my vocal cords were pretty damaged from the stress, though I don't even remember yelling. But I didn't really need to ask the question anyways. Deep down, I knew the answer. And the answer left me broken and emotionless. I grabbed some paper charts that were on the nightstand next to me and snatched the pen that was in the man's front pocket. He didn't flinch. I wrote a simple question on the paper and presented it to the man. Do you kill those fucking things? He read it, and then nodded to me, saying, We sure do kill those fuckers and anything else that we might deem a creature of chaos. I finally managed to wheeze out two words. I'm in. I've been with the organization ever since, working my way up. I've never looked back, and I don't plan to. The day I look back on my past and begin to miss it is the day I retire from this job. But I am not nearly done yet. Just like last time, feel free to leave your questions in the comments, and I will see y'all next time. Well, Jesus, I thought a pale was only a, a level 4, if I'm remembering correctly. I don't know what this thing was that was a level 49, but definitely a terrifying thing, and it has caused some severe tragedy, honestly. Mark could have been a different man. He could have led an entirely different life, but that wasn't the way that the chips fell. I suppose good on him for doing what needed to be done, standing up, taking his revenge, but it couldn't have been an easy thing to get over, and I'm sure he still has some deep scars about it. I don't know how much hunting and killing of these creatures it'll take to heal those scars. Truth is, they'll probably never heal, but as long as it gives him a sense of purpose, I suppose that that is the best that we can hope for at this point. <sighs> hope you're doing well out there, Mark. It's been three years since we've heard from either Mark or Cole, but I do sincerely hope that they are hanging in, and I hope that you're doing the same, friends. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, do all those things. I definitely appreciate it. I will see you again tomorrow with yet another creepypasta video in a new series, which is quite exciting. I hope you're looking forward to it. Keep yourself safe out there. Until then, keep a grenade handy if you're able. Those things seem to come in useful more often than not. And I will see you in the next one. So until then, friends, bye-bye.